Yeah, Morning all, now. thanks so much for uh, joining us. Excuse the last minute techno faff, which uh, you can do. You can do your sound tests an hour before live and uh, yeah, then, then come up with a, an issue at the last moment. And Same it, thing yesterday. Yeah, I was make, you know, we'll, we'll build another uh, check in five minutes before we go live, shall we? Mm. Um, I was saying good afternoon and it is now afternoon. Welcome to Bournemouth for day three of our live coverage of Air Festival. Um, I hope you've been enjoying the coverage. It's been. Uh, yesterday was fantastic. Thursday we won't talk about, but yesterday a pretty well full flying display. I uh, saw everything, but not, necessar not necessarily in order it was supposed to happen, but you know, that's the way of air shows. Yeah, and some spectacular conditions at points, especially for the evening show. Yeah, the typhoon, there was just that moment where, um, you know, you could see typhoon out to the east there and, uh, you know, winding up for the display. And then I just felt the sun hit the back mm. of my head, which had moved around behind us. We could, we could see the gap in the sky gap in the cloud sort of low above the horizon and I was hoping 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 we'd get that sunset you know that lovely warm light to accompany what yeah. was a spectacular what was always a spectacular typhoon display. perhaps it speaks to our personalities a little <laughs> but half an hour beforehand you were looking at that gap in the clouds saying I reckon the sun will be there during the typhoon and I was saying no it won't uh, be. yeah I egg and my face came into contact with each other we chop and change on the optimism front and uh, the pessimism pessimism front um, I think right now we're both feeling pretty optimistic about yeah, today's flight. looking like a good day. So we're looking at the TAF from Bournemouth Airport earlier and it was uh, uh, showing some low cloud around at about a thousand feet until approximately midday, which it is now, and then the cloud lifting uh, three and a half thousand feet, which will be more than enough to see everything fly. Will we get a Red Arrow's full display? Uh, well, right now. much like yesterday, just offshore, uh, there's very little cloud at all. So. Um, yeah, it's a long way off yet. We've got five hours or so to go until the Reds do uh, run in to start their show. But if it stays like it is at the moment, it could be another Red Arrows full display. Now, we were expecting flying to start at one. I believe that's now changed to 22. Yeah. Um, I haven't seen an updated schedule. No. Um, so take this with a pinch of salt. Yes. <laughs> this is the running order as it was about ago. three days ago. Yes. So the running order, starting with the Tigers. Slingsby Firefly, Bronco, Firebirds, Battle of Britain Memorial Flight, Lancaster and Typhoon Duo display, and then the Typhoon Solo. Following that, a 40-minute break. The second of our three blocks of flying, uh, starting at about 3 o'clock, Tutor, Chinook, Yak 50, Rolls-Royce Heritage Flight, uh, the Fairy Swordfish with the Westland Wasp, the Starlings Aerobatic Team, Rich Goodwin in the Jet Pits, and then the Red Arrows at 5 o'clock. Then we have another break of uh, about two hours, that will lead into the night show. It's a little bit of a longer night show than yesterday, starting at uh, just before half past seven uh, with a solo Spitfire, followed by the Typhoon, the Firebirds, Otto the Helicopter, um, and closing with the Tigers. I should give a bit of a brief introduction to the team here. So my name's Ian, I run Planes TV, started by my old man Adrian, who's uh, over there. We were hoping to get him on camera, but we sent him off to grab the lunch is a little bit too close to live time it turns out his walking pace not allowing him to join us but i'm hoping prior to the flying starting at uh yeah 35 minutes time we might get a little word from adrian about uh, the business and well, uh, 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 shows in general if i can leave you to fend for yourself we can go and swap microphones around and I can well, let's, send him in. we'll play a little video we'll make it even more uh, smooth than that adam why not so oh. this is adam he'll be providing you with um commentary during the show talented camera operator in his own right but he's set up a little deck chair over there and i've started to twig why he enjoys commentary more than uh, camera camera operating, operating work and um, and then behind the scenes we've got andrew uh, live mixing the show so indebted to the efforts of these guys particularly on Thursday morning when it was tipping it down you know setting up it was pretty miserable and we were all questioning what on earth we were doing but on a day like today we, we none of us would rather be anywhere else yeah, I don't think it all makes sense <laughs> so we've been doing this for a few years I mentioned Adrian started the business uh, 33 four years ago and uh, we've been covering Bournemouth for very many of those years um, a couple of the clips we've got uh, from our archive and this is from our on-demand service so we stream both on here on free to view on youtube we do stream via our ptv on-demand service that's at watch.planestv.com and that site not only is for live broadcasting it also hosts our back catalogue if you're regular viewers you'll be sick of me going on about it and hopefully you'll have at least tried it out at some point at the moment we've got an offer on that service if you use the coupon code Bournemouth with a capital B, you'll get half price on your first month's subscription or first year. Um, 
so making a month cost five pounds rather than ten and you'll need to be a subscriber of that service or a channel member to join us tomorrow for the live broadcast so it won't be free to view it'll just be for channel members on youtube and for subscribers of the PTV On Demand service at watch.planestv.com. So if you feel like watching some of our back catalogue stretching back 34 years or indeed joining us for tomorrow's live broadcast, try uh, take a look at watch.planestv.com and use the coupon code Bournemouth with a capital B to get 50% off your first month or year year's subscription. Yeah. And just to be really clear about this, because I did see some questions popping up in the chat while everyone was waiting for the stream to start, uh, you can watch Sunday's stream by becoming a channel member on YouTube. There were some people asking about that. Yes, that is sufficient to watch Sunday's stream. However, that's not the full shebang. You don't get access to the uh, archive material. You won't get access to the live broadcast from the Duxford Battle of Britain Air Show in a fortnight's time, um, but it will get you access to Sunday's stream. Yeah, it's a little bit complicated. I'm basically trying out uh, streaming to members on, on YouTube, um, trying, to, trying to find what works for everybody. Um, yeah, one of those options. Uh, if, you feel, if you enjoy the coverage, or if you enjoyed the coverage yesterday and you like what you see today, maybe consider joining. And you're free to join us for a fourth day of action here from Bournemouth. Maybe consider one of those options for tomorrow's stream. And I talked about that back catalogue. I think Andrew's probably got a clip lined up just to give us a little break and maybe even shove a microphone on uh, the old man and get him to come and, come and talk to you as well. Um, we'll wind the clock back to Bournemouth 2015. Um, lots of uh, marine assault action and lots of nighttime displays. Watch out but for the onboard material during um, Aerospark's presentation. It's Bournemouth 2015. On with the August holiday seaside theme and on to Bournemouth, their air festival. Now that actually clashed with Shoreham, which was our focus for the weekend, so we've got just a taste of the Friday flying display here. Thursday was cancelled due to weather. The show gets a lot of support from the armed services, including the Royal Navy with warships and the Royal Marines, who provide the traditional opening to the show with a role demonstration based on anti-piracy operations. Bournemouth is another seaside show that places great emphasis on their evening flying display. Taking part this year was Brendan O'Brien and the Fireflies, the Red Devils Army Parachute Display Team and Aerosparks with their Grob 109 powered gliders.
Uh, the night show here at Bournemouth as well, that material from Bournemouth 2015, a segment from our British Air Shows programme, which is a series you started, Dad. So Adam's dramatically morphed into Adrian here. This is Adrian started the business. My dad start, started the business, what, 34 years ago? 34 years ago, yes. It uh, doesn't seem that long ago. I can remember <laughs> it, uh, that first air show to this day, North Weald, uh, the uh, fighter meet they called it. And uh, I was just explaining to someone a minute ago, I didn't start in air show videos. We started with uh, just making uh, corporate stuff, but we did an air show program and offered it as a video. And the people came back and said, this is wonderful. It's fantastic how you don't have lots of interviews and don't have lots of music and it's good, clean sound and it's all aeroplanes. And, uh, and we thought, well, let's do another air show. So we did another one, same reaction, another one. And by the end of the year, we were just doing air shows. People loved it. And the style's pretty much the same now. We, we, we do try really hard to prioritise good, clean audio of, uh, of aircraft uh, uh, alongside Adam's wonderful commentary. And you'll get a little bit of music this evening to accompany some of the... Um, night displays which I think is fair you yeah. know the relatively quiet aircraft and it enhances the otherwise a fireworks display bit of a challenge at a show site like today we had the uh, band down there during the Battle of Memorial flight yesterday which is a bit of a shame wasn't it rather than well that's what happens with live mm -hmm. uh, obviously for our first 25 26 27 years we weren't live we were recording the shows editing putting out a video DVD uh, that's evolved as people have got the internet and start watching on the internet and 10, 11 years ago we said um, we really ought to set up our own television channel. Part of the reason for doing it that was that we kept saying to the TV broadcasters can we produce an air show programme for you on TV and the reaction we always got was well aeroplanes are boring so not just all aeroplanes but if we do lots of parallel stuff that wasn't what we wanted to do that wasn't what our customers were telling us they want to watch the aircraft they want to listen to them so hey we thought well we'll set up our own TV channel and that's what we've done and that's what we're asking you folks to subscribe to which is uh, watch.planestv.com which is the way we earn our money we love to come to these shows but we don't get paid to do it and uh, it's really kind when someone pops in two pounds, five pounds, it buys our dinner that night. But uh, we really are hoping to uh, get people to join our channel, subscribe to it. Uh, there's a huge amount there that uh, isn't really obvious. I've just got a couple of examples here. Our stock product for, what, 30 odd years was British Air Shows, uh, a compilation of. Uh, of the best shows of the year and we did that right up to what 2019 2018 2019 before covid and they're all there on the channels actually they may not all be there but most of them are and then a parallel came a little bit later european air shows where we went around lots of european shows there's a phenomenal amount of stuff to see on watch.planestv.com we don't make like, make it very easy to navigate the channel. There's a, it, it's like a sweet shop where none of the jars have got labels on. And oh, what shall I try next? Um, but uh, when you've paid your five pounds, the special offer to go and join us for a month, have a jolly good old delve into the channel and have a look what's there. There's hundreds of hours of really good stuff going to, back. Uh, yeah, I need to update my 33 years description on that. It says nearly 200 hours as well over 300 now having done a few seasons worth of live broadcasting um, but that back catalog is is wonderful you know you will find uh, some gems in there we we are working through the winter or will be working through the winter to bring more of it uh, to the service so if you're a, if you continue your subscription you'll see some of that come through as the winter months uh, draw in and i dig out the tapes your tapes start feeding them through machines so yeah that's one way of supporting us but another way uh, channel membership on youtube gareth ross i see has just joined thank you gareth for joining and uh, i think h vehicles were giving us a, a, a wave down uh, on the seafront there earlier on wave back to you h vehicles thank you so much for your support and um, i was so sorry i couldn't wave back i was busily uh, setting up stuff on the laptop but i think i think adam managed a wave back um yeah so uh, other ways of support well fx are helping us out this weekend aren't they Absolutely. Uh, we, we like working with parallel organisations. Uh, I've been an FX fan since I was that high. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we're doing a joint promotion with them this weekend. They're here at the show, so if there's anybody out there within uh, easy travelling distance of Bournemouth, come along, go to Airfix because uh, you can go get a free kit and build it on the spot. And uh, they've also got their shop there with a lot of discounts. And uh, we'll be doing more with Airfix as time goes by, because aircraft modelling, obviously more than aircraft, 
um, yeah, FX is a, is, is a big friend to us. And I think we've got a nice video which describes exactly where they are in the town. Hi everyone, my name is James. I'm here at Bournemouth Air Festival with Airfix. Please come down and say hello. We're currently building three Red Arrow Hawks, also with all the glue, paint, and everything included. Um, so if you're watching, please come down, please say hello, and enjoy the Air Festival. We've been building these three Red Arrows from Airfix, and you can paint them and you can glue them together like this one that's nearly complete. We just have this little part here to put that on, on the wing. We do indeed. And we're also here with our shop. And some of our best deals here are uh, quick builds, which are two for 25 pounds. And over there we have our starter sets at 10 pound each. To find our fix at Bournemouth this weekend, we're currently outside the old Debenhams building. over here. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Andrew. Uh, nice little video uh, giving you a uh, um, sight of where Airfix are today. And uh, yeah, if I had a few minutes myself, I wouldn't mind building one of those hawks. It's been a few years since I've put one together, but I do have a few net kits left over from last year. I need to uh, have a go at some point. My kid's just about old enough now to start getting their fingers stuck to bits of plastic and give it a go. Um, uh, nice of you to say so, uh, Daniel Kempfield, about the subscription saying, can confirm the £10 a month is worth it for the back catalogue alone. It's brilliant. It is fun. I mean, you know, Adrian and I edited these programmes and it's amazing how often you find yourself you know, just hunting through a programme for a bit of material and 40 minutes later you found yourself watching the whole thing. Dead right. I, can't, I was watching The Vulcan Effect the other day, probably one of the best programmes we've ever made. And I should have been doing something else, but I just thought, hang on, I've been sat watching this for 25 minutes. It's but, sad really, isn't it? Well, it's not sad. It's, it, it's, it's fun. It's enjoyable. But I'd love to know from people in the chat, going back, say, 20, 30 years, what's the best thing you've seen at an air show? What's maybe the best air show you've been to? And uh, I'll bet you, we've, we've, chances are we've done that air show, chances are we've done that aircraft uh, doing that performance. So tell us what, what you, the best thing you've ever seen at an air show. And let's see if we can come back and say, yeah, that's on our European Air Shows 2011, filmed at, uh, uh, at Nantes <laughs> in France, or <laughs> I don't know, Oshkosh in the USA in 1999, or, you know, oh mm. dear, 400, 500 air shows, they do blend yeah, after a while. Yeah, but we very much enjoy doing them, and Crunchy's asking, uh, Crunchied even, is asking if we have any plans to do EU air shows uh, next year. We do always cover NATO days, so we'll be there in a couple of weeks' time, NATO days in uh, the Czech Republic, uh, Ostrava, and um, that's a wonderful show to do. There's uh, very many I'd like to do on the continent, continent yeah, European air shows, which, yeah, that's 2011, so it probably doesn't include Ostrava, but um, uh, yeah, that's a great show. But I'd love to do more, and we're just at that sort of point, really, where there's enough support of the subscription service and... Um, and other platforms that we are at a point where we can start to do a little bit more um, especially when we get uh, get support from events that uh, such as Ostrava and Paul asking about how you could become a channel member if you're logged in on YouTube and within the YouTube app on your mobile phone or indeed on desktop look out for the join button so the join button is the way that you join as a channel member on YouTube, on YouTube. which will give you your uh, access to tomorrow's live broadcast and just one last reminder probably not one last but another reminder that uh, you can either do that to get access to tomorrow's live stream or you can subscribe to the um, service which has this back catalog on that's a website at watch.planestv.com make sure to use the offer code Bournemouth with a capital B to get half price off your first month or year so making it five pounds per month and the 50 pounds month. per year is a it's an absolute giveaway all right don't tell too many people um, okay. okay so monty lovely yeah okay lightning and starfighter at biggin hill remember which starfighter uh, action absolutely at our best starfighter oh, isn't on the channel yet yeah but that's what we need force, to do forcing mm. ian to do it this week we covered the, not doing it this a week. big starfighter event at grosetto uh they put uh, 11 starfighters up and we got the prime position on the airfield. They, they really hosted us. So our best starfighter material is, is in a program called Air Shows 99, which is when they were finishing uh, uh, over there. Um, that's not on the subscription channel yet, but I promise you it will be within the month if you're subscribing now, because <laughs> I will be forcing Ian to do it. One month puts us um, at the start of And on that over. same no program, cool, what a memory. Um, we've got some great stuff from Oshkosh, I remember. 
Uh, thank you, Arthur, Arthur, for joining as a channel member. You found that join button. Uh, we'll give you access to uh, tomorrow's live broadcast. And uh, yeah, a nice warm glow in the chat. You have the little icon to indicate that you're a supporter. So thank you very much for joining up. What was the other one? Lightning. Uh, you talked about lightning there, yes. We should probably, if you hadn't put so much Top Gun music on uh, Lightning A Tribute, which yes. was a very early programme, I'd have put that on the service by now. Yes, I, I could talk for ages on the lightning because I started the Lightning Association and uh, I was personally pretty instrumental in getting 724 back in the air and back to Binbrook. And we did make a programme then called A Warrior Returns, half hour programme about bringing 724 back to flight. And that's on the channel. If it isn't, it will be within the month. It Even might I be one know. of those with a little bit too much commercial music yes. on to uh, it. So, uh, yeah, li Lightning uh, is very close to my heart. Um, and uh, the, the reason being we're Lincolnshire born and bred, or, yeah, I suppose both Lincolnshire born and bred and lived near Binbrook for, for very right. many years. So That's went. right. Yeah. Um, yeah, Lightnings, wouldn't it be nice to have a few more? Thank you, Monty. You keep doing this, and I am very, very grateful for gifting uh, memberships to Steve and Danielle and uh, Joe and Rich and, uh, not Joe actually, Rich and Stephen. So uh, Monty's gifted five and YouTube decides who to gift those to. Um, thank you for that, Monty. Very much appreciate your ongoing support. And the other channel membership, Arthur, we said thank you to, didn't we? Yeah, thanks for joining everybody. Just about, uh, what time do we say? We said, oh, 20 minutes. So it's about 20 to one where, um, Flying will start. And thank you, Michael. I'll see you in the chat for sending uh, the updated schedule. I should really go and buy a program. I really should do that because um, the app, the Bournemouth app, does give access to um, updated uh, running orders. So starting at 20 to 1 with the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight, following that, the Lancaster and Typhoon formation. I haven't seen this yet. But I'm really looking forward to it. A few passes and a very dramatic break uh, sort of on the B axis toward the crowd. Very much looking forward to that uh, two ship display. Then the Typhoon Solo, which we very much enjoyed a couple of times yesterday, especially in the evening light. If you haven't uh, seen that material, it's worth winding like yesterday's live broadcast back. Or I think, I think there's a, a short on YouTube of some of the cool slow mo stuff we got of that. Then we have Firefly, Bronco, and the Firebirds team prior to the break. And then we'll pick up again at three o'clock um, with uh, yeah, RF Tutor, RF Chinook. Yak 50, the Rolls Royce Heritage Flight, Navy Wings Swordfish and Wasp, the Starlings, which we haven't seen yet, have we actually? They're just a booking over the two day weekend. Then the very special Rich Goodwin Pit Special, the Jet Pits, that very powerful piston engine augmented with two um, small jet engines on the side of the fuselage. Uh, one of my favourite displays this weekend for sure. And then closing out the Red Arrows at five, prior to a couple of hours gap before the flying, uh, the evening displays. We'll be looking forward to around about uh, it's about 20 to 8. It was yesterday. Don't have those listed there, but uh, this stream will stay active for the uh, evening displays. So uh, if you're watching, keep it open on a telly, and you can join us later on. Right. Uh, thank you, Neil, for signing up. And I saw someone else as well. No, it was Neil. Um, yeah, lots of new channel memberships coming in. Thank you. It really does help support us, and not just in the way of giving you access and uh, to, to tomorrow's live stream that channel memberships thing does just give me that extra incentive to do a little bit more on youtube we do like coming out doing free to view stuff you know the larger audience is always good fun um, but the, the the paid paid service is a it's a balancing act you know trying to find uh, what works so thank you for your support there and for anyone else who's a subscriber on watch.plainstv.com that service um i mentioned briefly the sort of back catalogue well, not that briefly, actually. The back catalogue that it gives access to. Most recently, uh, the most recent live broadcasts we've done through that service were the Royal International Air Tattoo, of course. And I've had a, a tweet, a, a tweet, an X. What do you call a DM on Twitter these days? Who knows? Um, but asking whether there's a, a DVD of React 2023 coming out. We're not doing DVDs anymore. These are... Yeah, I mean, yeah. you can buy one. We do, we do still sell them, but we're not producing new ones. But we will be editing a sort of two hour highlights program from Air Tattoo this year. But I thought I'd give you a little sense of what that will include with this highlights video from this year's show.
<laughs> so I see Gillian. So that was um, our highlights video from Royal International Air Tattoo, which we shot back in July. Always a fun show, that one, but a lot of hard work goes in there. Long days, aren't they? It is a long day, but uh, I'm probably going to upset the International Air Tattoo by saying, on this uh, European Air Shows one, you've got the, uh, the Netherlands um, at Volkel, the Luchmach Dagen, and the uh, European shows, some of them are very every bit as good as, as Riyadh, and uh, there's some great shows out there. Absolutely. But, uh, I'm going to plug again. Here's two DVDs, which may be still for sale on our channel, oh, no. and they'll cost you £50, £25 each. But what's the better deal? Two DVDs, £50, or a whole year on watch.planestv.com, where you can watch these and 200 of us like this. You can tell he sold cars for a living once in a while, didn't you? It's uh, oh, okay. £50 to watch our massive back catalogue. Go on, guys. Join <laughs> watch.planestv.com. And, uh, be, it will be amazing, I promise you. But you'll have to hunt a little bit for the content. Yeah, and the coupon code is Bournemouth, capital B, will get you 50% off your first month. John, thank you so much for your emails. Oh, yes, yeah. I do get them. Uh, thank you for signing up. Uh, thank you for being a channel member and uh, for your, for your um, correspondence. If you're subscribed to the email newsletter, there's a link to that in the description below. I think I did send one out today. I did manage to get to that this morning. Thank you, Adam's nodding. He is, he's obviously on the list. He's done, done his duty of signing up for email newsletters from Planes TV. There's a link in the description to allow you to do that. Replies to that come directly to me, so you can tell me to get that Airshows 99 programme with the Grissetto Starfighter material onto the s subscription service gosh, and gosh. Uh, other bits and pieces. And John's always very good at uh, updating me on what the Buccaneer guys are doing at Campbell, etc. Do get the emails, don't always get the time to respond, as you know, John, sorry. But I, I do like to, wherever I possibly can do. I've got about 60 uh, emails as a result of Airset 2 that are all well-wishing emails saying thanks for the coverage, thank you, well done. And none of them were asking for a reply specifically, but they're all people I'd like to get back to at some point. That I snooze those emails at the start of every week at the moment because it's, we're just too busy with events. But at some point, I'll get back to everyone to say, I'm glad you enjoyed the coverage. Uh, yeah, so we're winding up now. So we've got nine minutes to go. I heard a bit of a roar over there. It could have been a typhoon starting up potentially, which is our second act joining the Lancaster uh, Lancaster being part of the Memorial Flight, which, kick, which, is, which is kicking off the flying at 20 to 1 in just nine minutes' time. So a little bit of time now for us to start thinking about whether the cameras are switched on and pointing in a general direction of some aeroplanes. Um, Adam's flicking through his notes, getting ready to give you some commentary during the flying. We're not tapped into the event commentary today. Um, Adam's going to give you um, commentary throughout, and it's always gone down very well. He does a very good job. And Adrian and I will be on camera. We're quite looking forward to it today. Yeah, camera's been my uh, my thing for 30 odd years, but at this age, you can creak <laughs> a little bit. So uh, I get Ian to do the, the big lens camera, which was genuinely hard work. I'd love to see uh, uh, even professional camera people try and film some aircraft. But uh, yeah, I go back a bit, and if there's anybody out there with any of our really old programs, the, the 90s stuff, the American air shows at Alconbury, or Upper Hayford, Bentwaters, on video still, just let us know on the chat. I'd love to know if any of you have still got our sort of really early programs from Biggin Hill and, and Woodford. That was one of my favorite locations. So many air shows we've lost. Yeah, and the one thank you we haven't done just quite yet is um, this vantage point is provided to us by the hotel that we're stood on. So the Cumberland Hotel, um, Bournemouth with the cliffs gives you this remarkable vantage point to look down on some of the displays. Um, and we're at that little bit higher on, on the roof here at the Cumberland Hotel. We're indebted to them and their support providing this as a, as a platform for us to operate. Um, it's a wonderful hotel. I said yesterday I've stopped looking over uh, the balcony here at the hospitality area downstairs which is one way that you can enjoy the Bournemouth Air Festival. It's come to the Cumberland Hotel, the hospitality downstairs. It's sold out for this year but for maybe for future years consider it. It looks pretty nice down there doesn't it? It does absolutely. This is perfect weather for an air show, clear, lots of cloud about. It's going to be great stuff. And if you're uh, in the hospita hospitality area at uh, the Cumberland Hotel, you'd have access to the swimming pool, the bar, the food. Oh, it's just looking very nice down there. So big thank you to the Cumberland Hotel for, for their support again this year. Adrian and Adam came and used uh, this as a platform last year and we've got uh, yeah, more of us here this year. And uh, yeah, very grateful for the, the support of the Cumberland Hotel. So I can see in the chat, and this is very useful, so it's not 
normally at a show we might have a commentator nearby or a FDD client display director nearby who can give us a little update on what's going on. Um, the chat becomes that func provides that functionality for us here, so people looking on flight radar and perhaps listening to air band scanners updating us on what's going on. And of course we've got access to the same things, but I enjoy the crowdsourcing through the chat, so thank you for keeping us up to date. Um, Michael saying that the BBMF are airborne. So I think it's probably about time that you and I popped onto a camera and handed over to Adam. I think just for the, the moment or two, um, maybe we could play out a little bit of an earlier Bournemouth, Andrew. Um, if you can find a short one for me and, and we'll share another bit of material from uh, our back catalogue of air shows. So Bournemouth in 2010, that's one of the earlier ones that we covered. This is another segment from one of these British air shows programmes. And if you do subscribe to watch.planestv.com, they're a good place to start to get a bit of, bit of an idea of the style and the sorts of events that we cover. So here's uh, another wind of the clocks back to 2010 to the Bournemouth Air Festival from that year. We just made it from Dawlish in time for the evening show there. Evening shows are becoming especially popular at the seaside. It's a wonderful extra dimension to their events. Come show day itself, there really wasn't much evidence that this was a late August summer weekend. The event had to cope with appalling weather conditions when there was very little that was able to fly. There was one man up to the task though, national aerobatic champion Gerald Cooper in his cap 232. And he did his very best to reward the audience for sticking it out in the miserable weather. The Royal Marines were also, of course, able to put on their beach assault. Would you expect anything less? Adrian and Ian, who were talking to you earlier, have now taken their positions behind me at the cameras. And uh, we are very shortly about to see the Battle of Britain Memorial flight running in to start their display. I'm going to attempt to talk you through the action. 
Although uh, not too much talking during the BBMF because I imagine you'd rather hear the sound of six uh, Rolls-Royce Merlin engines. I would like to very quickly say thank you to Mike W, uh, who is our latest Planes TV channel member. Uh, thank you, Mike, for supporting us, and you will have access to our live coverage of the air show tomorrow. But I think it's probably time uh, now to uh, head over to Ian's camera, who's picked up the Battle of Britain Memorial flight, who are running in now to start their display. A lovely three-ship formation of Lancaster B1, Hurricane Mark 2C, and Spitfire LF9E. BBMF and the Typhoon between them will be occupying our attention for the next half hour or so, initially with this three-ship display, then the duo with the Lancaster and the Typhoon, and then the Typhoon solo. Battle of Britain Memorial Flight was founded in 1957 as the historic aircraft flight at that point with one Hurricane and three Spitfires and in fact we're going to see one of those founding three Spitfires as part of the Rolls-Royce Heritage Flight later today. Currently they operate one Lancaster, one Dakota, six Spitfires, two Hurricanes and two Chipmunks. Those Hurricanes being used, sorry, those Chipmunks being used as training aids for the fighters not as airshow aircraft in their own right. now for the two fighters to break away we will then have solo displays from each aircraft in turn starting with the Spitfire then the Hurricane and finally the Lancaster there you go the fighters now we will get a fly pass from all three of those aircraft in turn before the start of the solo displays It is the Hurricane which will first be flying back towards us. As we wait for that to come around, I'd just like to say thank you to Pink Hector, who has gifted one Planes TV channel membership to Ben PNC. Ben PNC, welcome to the channel, and thank you to Pink Hector. Lancaster and the Hurricane now clear the way for our Spitfire solo. The 
Spitfire solo display redesigned for the 2022 display season with some very tall, graceful looping and quarter clover manoeuvres such as the one we are seeing now. That was to mark the Queen's Platinum Jubilee and a very similar display profile has been maintained for 2023. Spitfire LF-9E, LF standing for low flying, meaning this aircraft was optimised for use in the low level environment. It is painted with the code 3QJ in desert camouflage, representing a Spitfire Mark 9 of 92 Squadron, which served in Tunisia in 1943. Spitfire comes towards the end of its display. I want to say a quick thank you to Liam Roberts, who has contributed two pounds. Thank you very much, and that'll uh, all go towards our dinner tonight. Arriving underneath that gorgeous Spitfire roll, we have Hurricane Mark 2C PZ865. This is the very last Hurricane to have been built. It's painted in a rather unusual black colour scheme, representing a 247 Squadron Night Fighter based at Pradanic and Exeter. aircraft this represents undertook defensive night fighter patrols and night intruder operations over enemy territory correspondingly she wears half size low visibility roundels and a matte black paint scheme
So as the hurricane completes and, com and clears out to our right, we look out for something very special indeed. There it is, the site of a Lancaster B1 in close formation with the Royal Air Force Typhoon FGR4. This display, new for the 2023 season and marking 80 years since Operation Chastise, the Dam Busters raid. Fascinating to see the typhoon flying at a fairly noticeable angle of, angle of attack there. Right towards the uh, bottom end of its speed envelope in order to fly formation on the Lancaster. They're going to be giving us three passes in formation. And as they reposition for the second, I would like to say thank you to Liam Roberts, who has gifted us a little under five pounds and says he hopes the weather stays nice for us. Well, the forecast for the next two days is more of what you're seeing now, and we can't wait to share it all with you. we see today wearing a special paint scheme it's known as blackjack matte black over the majority of its wings and fuselage that color was applied when the aircraft was utilized for aggressor duties a few years ago but then in 2021 it was selected as the typhoon solo display aircraft and union jack decals were applied this is one of the very last air shows at which we will be seeing it because blackjack is coming towards the end of its fatigue life and is due to be retired from service before the start of the 2024 display season. Arthur Tushed's Jackson saying, I'm sure they did this last year too. They did something similar. They did um, a Spitfire and Typhoon duo display last year. Exactly the same sequence, but quite a different spectacle seeing the Typhoon in formation with such a large aircraft as the Lancaster is. of our three formation passes. I see that. They're not doing uh, quite what I expected them at the moment. I was expecting uh, the aircraft to turn round and approach from the front uh, for an on-crowd break, but they've instead turned to our right. And isn't that a lovely shot at the moment with a headland in the distance? Perhaps we're going to get an extra pass.
Max Bankangle says the Lancaster could be used in the air-to-air -air refueling role. Well, funny you should say that. Um, actually, it was Lancastrians, a development of the Lancaster, that were used uh, to conduct the very first air-to-air -air refueling flights via the hose and drogue method. That was in the days following the Second World War, a system developed by Aerial Refueling Limited, the company that went on to become Cobham, is now Draken Europe. Well, let's turn our attention back now to the Lancaster and the Typhoon running in from the front for a break. time to increase the volume the sound of two Eurojet EJ200s on full reheat as we start the Typhoon solo display pounds of thrust with reheat, a top speed of Mach 2, and a very potent fighting machine with no fewer than 13 weapons hard points. flown by Flight Lieutenant Matt Brighty and he's come up with a routine slightly different to what we've seen in previous years and I'll be pointing out some of those more unusual manoeuvres as they occur And here comes one of those new manoeuvres now, as the aircraft climbs off to our left, we are about to see a very dramatic negative G bunt, with the nose pointing towards us then, a bit of forward stick, as we see now, and a roll on the down line, the Typhoon limited to 270 degrees per second in roll, making it one of the fastest rolling fourth or fifth generation fighters. stand corrected 250 degrees in roll 270 is the Rafale vapour here in the humid air and shows that the aerodynamic surfaces are working hard to create lift under high G loads creating areas of very low pressure above the wings that reduces the air temperature cooling it below its dew point and causing the moisture within it to condense here a very challenging slow roll flown while maintaining perfectly level flight. Lots of cross control there, use of the rudder, ailerons and elevators. And from a slow roll to a slow pass. A few years ago, the Typhoon displays started uh, performing these slow passes on the left 45 degree line towards the crowd rather than on the A axis from left to right. And this only goes to emphasize the aircraft's low speed and high angle of attack, limited to 
24 degrees angle of attack by the flight control software. But from this angle, it does look like rather more than that. And from this slow pass, a demonstration of the Typhoon's power accelerating into a loop. Excellent performance in terms of its turn rate. It's a 9G aircraft limited to 23 degrees per second sustained turn rate. We're about to see that demonstrated in a 360 degree minimum radius turn. Very unusual manoeuvre now, one that uh, I've not seen from Typhoon displays before. A half Cuban with a knife edge recovery. There it is, an excellent view of the plan form of the aircraft and those Union Jack decals. This particular Typhoon is a Tranche 1 aircraft. It is exclusively an air defence fighter, which can be armed with short and medium range air to air missiles. More recent Typhoons can also take on ground attack, anti shipping, and reconnaissance duties. While these older Tranche 1 Typhoons are due to be retired by the Royal Air Force by around 2025, the newer examples are shortly to go through a major upgrade programme. That will include the fitting of BAE Systems and Leonardo's European Common Radar System Mark II, which is one of the most advanced electronically scanned array radars in the world. give the Typhoon new and highly potent air-to-ground capabilities, as well as introducing electronic surveillance and electronic attack capability, allowing Typhoon pilots to find and degrade enemy radars. That is how we end a Typhoon display. An unrestricted climb with aileron rolls in the vertical. That was Flight Lieutenant Matt Brighty in the Royal Air Force Typhoon FGR-4. And following that, we have something of a change of pace because we've gone from something very loud, very fast, to something that is, uh, well, I think, rather graceful. It is now the turn of the Tigers parachute display team to take centre stage, although we are anticipating a short gap before they do fly. We will see their uh, Cessna 208 caravan jump ship fairly shortly, I would imagine, and that will conduct a woody drop. So 
so while we wait for that, I would just like to uh, say hello to everyone who has joined us over the course of the last few minutes. Welcome to Plains TV's live coverage of the Bournemouth Air Festival 2023. We are here all four days of the festival, and that includes the last day of the festival tomorrow. Although, I'm afraid, if you want to join us for tomorrow's stream, you will have to pay a little bit of money because that stream will be available uh, to subscribers to our on-demand video service, watch.planestv.com, uh, and also to our channel members on YouTube, our paying channel members, that is. If you want to join our on-demand service to enjoy Sunday's live broadcast from here at Bournemouth, then head to watch.planestv.com and use the offer code Bournemouth. That will give you 50% off your first month. £5 for a one-month subscription to watch.planestv.com. And as part of that one month, uh, that will also give you access to our upcoming live broadcast from the Duxford Battle of Britain air show. That is going to be an absolutely tremendous event, including, uh, by the current count, 12 Spitfires, 4 Hurricanes, a unique formation of B-17 with Lancaster, and two more days of the Red Arrows. In addition to that, you will also have access to the back catalogue of programmes that Adrian and Ian were talking to you about earlier. If you enjoy the Typhoon display, then do stick with us all day because that is not the last bit of Typhoon action that we will see today. We are also anticipating seeing it return as part of our Twilight show, slot time 19.39. And anyone who was watching our live coverage from the Air Festival yesterday will know what a spectacular affair that can be with the uh, reheats from those two EJ200 standing out superbly well against the darkening sky. But we look out now for the Cessna Caravan of the Tigers parachute display team from the British Army. I think I did possibly just hear Ian saying he might have spotted something. It's operating not from Bournemouth, as with most of the rest of the aircraft, but from Netherhaven. That is the base of the Army Parachute Association, and it is that organisation that operates this Cessna caravan might be a military team, but the aeroplane operates on the civil register. Similar sort of arrangement to the RAF Falcons in that regard, who use a Dornier 228 on the civil register. And Ian has spotted that Cessna 208, an aircraft that is highly suited to these parachute jump operations. It has a powerful Pratt & Whitney PT-6A turboprop engine, giving it a climb rate of 1,200 feet per minute. That is reasonably good for an aircraft in this class and allows it to climb to altitude between jumps relatively quickly. It has a high wing and a large cargo door at the rear of the aircraft to allow for unobstructed exits by the jumpers and a capacity of 14, although we're not expecting to see 14 jumpers today. The Tigers parachute display team has nine members, and I think we're expecting to see six or so in today's jump. They will be jumping in two groups. The first group jumping with flags and descending individually to land on the beach. And then we'll have some canopy relative formation work by a second group of jumpers. There go the woodies. And the team will be very carefully watching the flight path of those woodies as they descend. And this is a, a way of judging the wind conditions and making sure that an appropriate point has been selected for the parachutists to leave the aircraft, allowing them to make it safely to the jump zone in the current wind conditions.
We're not going to be able to bring you footage of the parachutists actually landing, I'm afraid. This is one of the few limitations of our chosen vantage point. We're on the roof of the Cumberland Hotel, who for a second year are very kindly hosting us here. And what a spectacular vantage point it is. We have significant elevation compared to the water. Aircraft here at the show allowed to come down as low as 100 feet. We are more than 100 feet up, and you could probably tell that during the Typhoon display. And if you want to enjoy this view, well, it's possibly a little bit too late to book yourself in here for this year's air festival. But they do have rooms available looking out towards the beach. And if you don't want overnight accommodation, well, uh, they do host daytime hospitality. They've got a lovely swimming pool and restaurant out uh, on the patio below, and they had a live band down there last night. What a lovely way to enjoy the air show. Spotted a couple of new Planes TV channel members joining us in the last few minutes. Paul Ludlow and Simon, thank you very much for joining us. It is people like you who encourage us to go out and do those free live streams, such as today, such as uh, Air next week, Jersey, the week after that. The Duxford Flying Finale will go out free on YouTube as well, and those of you who do join us as channel members, it does help make that much more rewarding and much more viable. And that is why, as a special thank you, we are making our uh, paid access stream uh, on Sunday available to channel members, in addition to our subscribers at watch.planestv.com. Now, there's a little bit of guesswork going on at the moment as to exactly what is going on because something else uh, about our location here. We're quite used to being next to the flying display director and the commentator. We can often hear the commentary quite well and, uh, and feed that straight to you, which means we tend to be pretty clued in as to what's going on, but we're kind of marooned up on the roof without any contact with uh, anyone in the airshow organisation. So... It is possible that we've just had a dummy run. And equally possible that in the wind conditions, they have elected not to jump. I have seen parachute display teams jump in much stronger wind than this, uh, but undeniably those woodies did drift quite a long way along the shoreline as they fell. Angus Cooper asks, will you be heading to Ostrobert for NATO days? Well, I personally won't. That will be... Uh, Ian and ooh, either Andrew or Andy, I'm not sure. They will be heading over to provide a live camera for the official NATO Days live broadcast. Um, that weekend, uh, Adrian and... Is Andy going to NATO Days? Because Adrian, Andy and I are at Duxford for the Battle of Britain air show, the air show that I was describing with all the Spitfires and Hurricanes. And we will be broadcasting Duxford exclusively on watch.planestv.com for our subscribers there. So now would be a very good time to sign up to that service. Remember, we are running the discount code Bournemouth for 50% off, and that will get you access to Sunday's stream from here at Bournemouth, but also to the Duxford stream in a few days' time. Well, just emerging from cloud above us, we have the Tigers Cessna Caravan. And I would anticipate the aircraft will fly over the top of us, skimming the cloud base. And then just after passing, we will start to see parachutists leaving the aircraft. There is a smoke trail in evidence already. And the first jumpers to leave will be uh, giving us a free-fall demonstration down to about 3,000 feet. There they go. And possibly no free-fall demonstration today because of the cloud base going by the uh, TAF at uh, Bournemouth Airport, actually. It was predicted to be about uh, three and a half thousand feet, which is probably a little bit too low for that free ball.
Tigers are one of four parachute display teams of the British Army, the others being the Red Devils, the Lightning Bolts and the Silver Stars. This particular unit is composed of members of the Princess of Wales Royal Regiment. It was formed in 1986, originally under the name the Dragons. Well, given the low cloud base, I was hoping we'd see uh, some canopy relative formation work, but it does look like uh, all the jumpers have elected to deploy their parachutes immediately and descend individually. Well, we are at least seeing some of the flags being deployed. I can see uh, two flags, I can see a Union Jack, and I can also see the TSA consulting flag. TSA Consulting being the organisation that uh, runs the flying display here at Bournemouth on behalf of BCP Council. Big thank you to Liam Roberts for contributing two pounds. It all helps encourage us. Um, Michael Aviation has obviously uh, heard a little bit of the uh, PA system uh, confirming that that was a low show. Well, that explains what we just saw. And Chris Beatman saying great coverage. We've been going every year for the last six years, but sadly this year cannot make it. Um, following your wife's surgery, well, I wish her well and sorry you couldn't be here, but I'm very glad that we could bring you the action live on YouTube. And I hope you are enjoying the show. say one of the problems with parachute display teams problem is is probably an unfair word but one of the factors uh, with parachute display teams is that their slot time is uh, always of a rather uncertain nature there could be a number of dummy runs or there could not be there sometimes there's a woody drop sometimes there isn't if it's a low show then uh, the duration of the jump is much shorter than if it's a high show and that means that when we do uh, get parachute drops in the middle of a flying display, as we're seeing today, there do tend to be some gaps both before and afterwards to allow for the, uh, the uncertain runtime of that performance. So it's 13 minutes until we're expecting our next aircraft to enter the aerobatic box. That will be a Slingsby T67M Firefly Mark II flown by Rod Dean. Always a lovely display and we very much look forward to it. But in the meantime, perhaps I can describe uh, some of what uh, you're seeing uh, on the picture now. If you're not familiar with Bournemouth, the pier uh, in your shot at the moment is not Bournemouth Pier, but Boscombe Pier. There's two piers here, and uh, Boscombe Pier off to our left, Bournemouth Pier to our right. The air display taking place uh, between the two of them. Show centre is biased slightly towards the Boscombe end. Uh, there's a big apartment block about 300 metres to our left called Albany Apartments. That is uh, the show centre marker uh, as used by the display pilots. So we're pretty close to show centre here but not quite on it as you would have seen during the uh, uh, Lancaster and Typhoon break. They weren't quite coming straight towards us but uh, near enough that we still got the full effect of the manoeuvre. The other thing that you can see in that picture, down towards the bottom of the image, we have the RAF village, so um, you can see the Tutor solo display stand at the bottom of the screen, the Red Arrows uh, stands are there as well. Uh, on the right-hand side of the image, there are some stands representing the various trades of the Royal Air Force, the Air Cadets, the Reservists, and so on, and with them they have a mock-up Chinook. We'll be seeing a real Chinook in the flying display later on, specifically a Chinook HC-6A from number 18 squadron at Benson and then in the water you can see uh, boys of various colours both orange and yellow ones they have several purposes 
One of them is to mark the maritime exclusion zone. So there's a large number of pleasure boats that turn up uh, to watch the show, and you've been seeing those in the background of many of our shots. Well, uh, there is, much like at an overland air show, a sterile area in which uh, the public are not allowed to be for safety reasons. So an outer ring of boys is marking uh, the zone into which the boats cannot enter and there's uh, a maritime equivalent to NOTAMs that publicise that exclusion zone in advance. There's a similar exclusion zone in place for swimmers about 50 metres off the shore is the edge of the swimming area and we're taking that line 50 metres offshore the edge of the swimming area to be our nominal crowd line so all of the display distances are being calculated from 50 metres out to sea the flying is therefore a little bit more distant than at uh, some other uh, air shows that you might have seen us covering over the years and then the large orange markers just out to sea they form three rows the row closest to us, running from left to right, is the 230 metre line and the A-axis. Running, uh, as I said, from left to right, the A-axis, uh, along parallel to the crowd line. 230 metre line, that's the standard separation for the majority of aircraft taking part in today's flying display. Some of them can come a little bit closer. The, the slowest, lightest, smallest planes can come into 150 metres or so. The second row of big orange boys running from left to right is the 450 metre line. For the fastest, most powerful aeroplanes, they fly at that increased separation distance while directing energy towards the crowd, and that is just to expand that safety buffer and make sure that if something were to go wrong um, at that particular point, when there's energy coming towards us, we are protected uh, and uh, nicely uh, insulated from what's going on in the air. The farthest row of orange boys in the far distance, those are lining the edge of the display area and maritime exclusion zone. The other term that you'll hear me using over the course of today's broadcast is B-axis. A-axis, B-axis. A-axis runs from left to right. That's the primary display line as marked by the boys that I just mentioned. B-axis is perpendicular to that uh, and it is for aircraft running in directly towards us, directly towards show centre rather, towards the Albany apartments. You see the red arrows make very good use of the B-axis for their uh, on-crowd bomb bursts, for example. So I think what I'll do now is uh, I'll try and work out which pocket I secreted my phone in and then it's over here uh, and then uh, run through the uh, running order for those of you who have been uh, joining us over the last few minutes. And we've already had the Battle of Britain Memorial flight, Lancaster and Typhoon and the Tigers. Expecting next, as I mentioned a few moments ago, the Slingsby Firefly. Then we have the OV-10B Bronco, fully aerobatic. That's a lovely display. Uh, and the Firebirds display team will round out our first block of flying for today. Following that, we have a break of about 45 minutes before getting back into the action with the RAF Tutor at 3 o'clock. The Chinook, the Yak-50, the Rolls-Royce Heritage Flight. Uh, Navy Wings are here with uh, the Swordfish and Wasp performing uh, short formation display and then solo displays from each aircraft in turn. At 16.24, we have a team that we haven't covered here at the Bournemouth Air Festival before. This is their first uh, day at the event, and that is the Starlings flying a Cat 232 and an extra NG. They are really fantastic, so uh, make sure you stick around for them. Following that, more aerobatic prowess from Rich Goodwin in his jet-powered pits. He's got his Lycoming uh, piston engine, putting out over 300 horsepower, but also a pair of Lynx turbojets, and uh, that's something a little bit different. And then at 5 o'clock, the Royal Air Force aerobatic team, the Red Arrows. That will conclude the second block of flying displays uh, at around about half past five. But we will be staying live because that is not the end of the day's flying action. 16.26, we have the start of the evening show, which includes a Spitfire solo, Typhoon FGR4, uh, the Firebirds returning, but with fireworks this time. Otto the helicopter, absolutely insane if you've never seen Otto before. It's an airborne launched fireworks show. 
And then we have the return of the Tigers jumping under cover of darkness with pyrotechnics. We will be here live all day broadcasting all of the action. Now, Ian reckons he might have spotted a Slingsby Firefly, and he's jumped on his camera now. Let's see if we can bring you any footage of it. Yes, there is the distinctive shape of a Firefly in the far distance. I can't see it with a naked eye, so it must be a very long way out. I want you to note the colour scheme of this aircraft as we see it running in towards us. As we see it running in towards us, you're going to see uh, this aeroplane uh, has a yellow top surface and a black underside. That was the standard uh, training scheme for RAF elementary flying trainers at one point in time. And the tutor from the Royal Air Force that we're going to see later on today is wearing a very similar colour scheme. That was applied a few years ago as an experiment in order to judge uh, which colour scheme could provide the uh, best visibility uh, for anti-collision purposes in the training environment. I don't actually know the results of that experiment, but the bulk of the Tudor fleet has remained in its uh, standard white paint scheme. So opening its show with a stall turn, the Slingsby Firefly, flown by Rod Dean. This aircraft started out as the Fournier RF-6 motor glider designed by the great René Fournier, uh, still alive and kicking at the age of more than 100. Unfortunately, it didn't sell very well, and after only 40 had been produced, the Fournier Aircraft Company collapsed. The design was picked up by the British manufacturer Slingsby. They fitted it with a much more powerful engine, 160 horsepower fuel-injected Lycoming AI0540 rather than 100 horsepower Continental 0200, and they began marketing it as an aerobatic training aircraft. Today we're seeing one of those military versions produced by Slingsby and they are recognisable primarily because of their enlarged cockpit canopy and that modification was made in order to accommodate the rather bulky military grade helmets that its pilots would use. Perhaps most notably the Firefly served with the United States and with our own Royal Air Force serving uh, in British use until 2010, whereupon it was replaced with the Grob Tutor. Many pilots actually preferred the Firefly to the Tutor though. It has a better roll rate and more power at its disposal, but it wasn't the ideal training aircraft because it had rather poor spin recovery characteristics, and sadly that did lead to a number of accidents. Today is Rod Dean. He's in his 51st display season. 
was a Royal Air Force veteran of 21 years, during which time he flew such aircraft as the Meteor and the Nat. He was also a Hawker Hunter display pilot. In the civilian world, he's displayed all manner of classic jets, T-33s, Sabres, Hunters, Vampires, Venoms and more. And that included leaded, leading an award-winning five-ship Hunter display at the Royal International Air Tattoo in 2001. He's also flown several piston warbirds from the Spitfire to the Corsair. And among his proudest achievements, he led a 19 aircraft big wing display at the Duxford Battle of Britain Air Show 2000. That was one of the first big Spitfire and Hurricane formations at a Duxford air show, but we'll be seeing another one in two weeks' time at their 2023 Battle of Britain show. We will be broadcasting that live, and it will be available exclusively to paying subscribers to watch.planestv.com. Remember, we have that offer code available for 50% off the first month. Head to watch.planestv.com and use the code Bournemouth with a capital B. Here, a demonstration of the Firefly's slow flying capabilities. Flying into wind. And you can just about make him out waving. Oh, he's not waving. I thought he was waving for a second. get a good juxtaposition here between the aircraft's low and high speed flaps extended at the moment for this slow pass with the aircraft flying into wind to make it appear even slower still and now Rod will reposition for a downwind pass retracting those flaps and increasing the power and hopefully we'll get a bit of a sense of speed While Rod doesn't display heavy warbirds anymore, he does display this Firefly, and he's very active on the airshow circuit. Primarily as a flying control committee member and flying display director at some of the UK's largest aviation events. Redhead asks, is the misdemeanor hunter flying today or not? Well, that was a Bournemouth Air Festival stalwart in the past, flown by Jonathan Whaley. We've shown some clips of it uh, before yesterday's live broadcast. I think we hope showed some misdemeanor Bournemouth footage. But it's not with us today. And with good reason, that aircraft has been sold to a new operator in Canada. That was about five years ago, as far as I can remember. And it uh, now operates out there in a new paint scheme on red air duties. But how nice it would be to see a Hawker Hunter performing in a British flying display again. It's been quite some years since we've seen one. There were whisperings of uh, a hunter being brought to a, a UK show two years ago, about two years ago. It very nearly happened, but I don't. I think the sponsor fell through at the last minute. 
of a treat that would have been. So next up, in a couple of minutes' time, we have the OB10B Bronco coming to us from the Bronco demo team in Belgium and flown by Tony De Bruyne. So they're all scanning the skies and looking out for the sign of uh, that very distinctive twin boom aeroplane. You see Ian has swung his camera around to our far right with intent, so I imagine you're about to see popping up on your screen the very decent, a uh, very distant image of a Bronco. Yes, there it is. So the aircraft you are looking at now in the very far distance is an American twin engine turboprop built as a short takeoff and landing light attack and observation platform, but uniquely it also offers cargo capacity. This combination of armaments, manoeuvrability and size allowed it to take on a huge number of roles from close air support to counterinsurgency, reconnaissance, pathfinder duties, light transport, forward air control and medical evacuation. Armed variants of the Bronco could carry 1.5 tons of external, external munitions including bombs, unguided rockets and AIM-9 sidewinder missiles. Machine guns were also housed in stub wings under the cockpit. This, however, is not an armed version of the Bronco. It's an OV-10B, a modified target tug version developed for the West German Air Force in the late 1960s. There are no weapons on board, and that cargo bay in the rear of the aircraft has been replaced by winching equipment, although that's been uh, removed now, it's in civilian hands. The clamshell cargo door at the back of the fuselage was replaced with a perspex dome, and there was a backwards-facing seat in that dome, which was occupied by the winch operator. The aircraft still wears its German colours, and as part of that, some very distinctive high-visibility orange markings. We'll be getting a good look at those orange markings as the aircraft comes by because they do stand out well uh, in the lovely sunny weather that we're enjoying here at Bournemouth today. Germany's Broncos were replaced in the 1990s by the Pilatus PC-7. Today, as I mentioned, this aircraft is owned by Tony De Bruyne's Bronco demo team which was founded in 2010 and is based at Flanders International Airport in Belgium. The Bronco demo team is a stalwart supporter of the British airshow circuit. Just in the last few years, we've seen this aircraft at the Midlands Air Festival, the Clapton Air Show, various RAF family days, and possibly several other events that don't come to mind at the moment. But this is the first time that it has participated in the Bournemouth Air Festival, as far as I'm aware. Certainly the first time in the last few years to see an aircraft of this size with the level of manoeuvrability that you are about to see demonstrated. This display is fully aerobatic. Second manoeuvre is going to be a fairly rapid aileron roll. Now this is an aircraft that has a crew of two but it can also carry up to six passengers in its cargo bay, not seated but sitting on the floor, giving it a total capacity of eight people. Well, how often do you see an aircraft with a capacity of eight flying inverted? That rear cargo bay could also be used to carry 1.5 tonnes of freight or a stretcher complete with uh, room for a medic as well and uh, that's why this uh, twin tail design was selected it allowed the fitting of a clamshell door with very easy access to that rear cargo area for the loading of cargoes and stre uh, of uh, cargo pallets and stretchers Let's see uh, Ian showing a, a shot ah there is a landing light in the middle of that image 
as the Bronco runs in towards us. A highly suited aircraft for the observation role as well, because as you'll see as it comes closer, the cockpit canopy uh, is um, slightly bulbous in nature, and that combined with a high wing means that the crew can stick their head out the side of the cockpit and look almost straight down. Redshaw, sorry, Joshua Davis says, I remember seeing the pairing of Bronco and Skyvan at Duxford some years back. Um, yeah, so this uh, organisation owns a couple of Broncos. I think only one is airworthy at the moment. They also have a short Skyvan, which they use as their support aircraft. But briefly, uh, in around 2016, 2017, they did utilise the Skyvan as a display aircraft in its own right. And that was something I never got to see personally. And, uh, Hopefully there isn't an, another chance in the future. I'm not sure if they still operate that Skyban. So, first manoeuvre of the show is a steep spiral climb and this showcases the power at the Bronco's disposal. Two Garrett T76G turboprops producing a combined 2080 shaft horsepower. That gives the Bronco a 3000 foot per minute climb rate and a top speed of 250 knots. If you compare that to the uh, Skyvan, uh, sorry the Caravan whose climb rate I was praising earlier, uh, well that was 1200 feet per minute. This Bronco can climb almost three times as quickly. repositioning out to our left and about to showcase that aerobatic maneuverability that I was describing earlier this is going to be an aileron roll impressive if you ask me but it's not just high speed maneuverability where this aircraft excels for its observation role it was important that the aircraft could fly slowly and likewise that was important for its short takeoff and landing capabilities at empty weight this aircraft could take off and land on runways of just 300 meters in length it is time to see a demonstration of that low speed performance with a dirty pass. Most famously, the Bronco was used by the US Air Force during the Vietnam War. Around 160 were in use during that conflict, more than a third of which were lost in accidents. Although it was retired by the US Air Force in 1991, they did evaluate the Bronco for reactivation in 2015. A pair of aircraft were pressed into service and performed over 120 combat sorties as part of Operation Inherent Resolve in Iraq and Syria. 
They apparently performed well, but the US Air Force ultimately decided not to reactivate the Bronco on the grounds of the cost and complexity associated with adding yet another distinct aircraft type to their inventory. Redhead uh, asks if the Catalina is going to be joining the flying lineup today and the Swordfish as well. Uh, well, the Swordfish, yes, is part of our flying lineup coming up in a, a, an hour or two's time. I'm not expecting to see the Catalina. We will, however, be seeing the Catalina at the Duxford Battle of Britain air show. And uh, so uh, if you do want to see a bit of Catalina action on Planes TV, make sure you subscribe to watch.planestv.com for running that 50% discount using the offer code Bournemouth. And we hope to broadcast the Catalina display at that event. Aside from the United States, several other nations also operated the Bronco, mainly countries with relatively limited defence budgets in need of a low-cost counterinsurgency aircraft. One of those nations, the Philippines, still uses the Bronco today, and they've been used in combat as recently as 2017. Knife-edge pass. noticeable upwards pitch before uh, Tony applied left stick to enter the knife edge portion of that pass. But that was to account for the altitude loss in the knife edge phase during which the wings are not producing any lift. You would have seen the nose slicing downwards. I was talking about the Filipino Broncos um, mentioning that they served in combat only a few years ago. Well they are at the end of their service lives. They're due to be retired in 2024 and replaced by the Super Decano. the capabilities which Broncos were required to have was uh, the ability to operate from improvised landing strips sometimes in contested territory and in order to ensure relatively safe operations from those strips the aircraft would approach at high altitude and make a very steep tactical approach that was to ensure that they could remain out of range of light arms from the ground for as long as possible. Well, we're about to see a steep approach demonstrated. Obviously, no landing today because we're at a seaside show. But nonetheless, the aircraft about to pitch down. There it goes. And holding that very steep downline without building airspeed. completes the display from Tony De Bruyne in the Bronco and it's as good a time as any for me to take a quick glance at the chat. Midnight Wolf says he's watching from Jersey in the Channel Islands. Well hello Midnight Wolf and we are very much looking forward to visiting Jersey in about 10 days or so. We'll be broadcasting the Jersey International Air Display free on YouTube. Daniel Griffiths asks is the B-17 expected to fly today or tomorrow? Uh, no I'm afraid it isn't but again if you subscribe to watch.planestv.com using the offer code Bournemouth to get your 50% discount, you will see it uh, at the Duxford Battle of Britain air show, not just flying a solo display, but also performing an incredibly rare formation sequence with the Battle of Britain Memorial Flights Lancaster. That will be a highlight of the entire air show season. I'd also like to welcome Roland Dunn as a Planes TV supporter. 
Thank you, Roland. We very much appreciate the support. And as a token of our appreciation, you will have access to our live broadcast from here at Bournemouth tomorrow. And thank you, Simon, for joining us as well. I'm glad we could bring uh, the air show action to you, and uh, hopefully you have a speedy recovery. Well, in the hold now, we have a pair of Vans RV4s from the Firebirds, the first of two occasions on which we will see them flying as part of today's display. We'll perform a day show now and then later on a twilight show with fireworks being launched from the aircraft mid-display. Arthur Two, Shed, Arthur Two Sheds Jackson said, any seaplanes ever display? Well, not today. We do get the Catalina, technically an amphibian rather than a seaplane, uh, displaying at a number of events. I just mentioned that a few minutes ago. Um, I, I believe that, and I'm not going to this show myself, so I haven't paid too much attention to it, but next week, uh, Ian and Adrian... Uh, we'll be heading up to Air in Scotland for the Air Show Festival of Flight, and part of the flying lineup there is Wee Dram, a Cessna float plane. Questions also about the Strike Master and the Vampire. We do have a Vampire due today, not a Strike Master. Taking centre stage now, currently performing a half Cuban to get turned around and come back towards us. We have the Firebirds, and apologies in advance for inevitably getting their name wrong at some point. I'm so much in the habit of calling these guys the Fireflies, because that was the name under which they were founded in 2017. organization was created by Andy Durston and John Gowdy uh, but they have since become rather too busy with their warbird projects to maintain the fireflies operation so they have gradually handed the team over to Nigel Reed and John Dodd. John and Nigel took full ownership of the fireflies last year and changed the name to Firebirds. This is a deceptively difficult display of formation flying because these aircraft have slightly different power plants. One has a 150 horsepower version of the, Ly of the Lycoming O320 with a two-bladed propeller. The other has a 160 horsepower engine with a three-bladed propeller. So keeping those aircraft in close formation and making sure that they can keep up with each other does require a certain amount of consideration. is an aeroplane that you can build in your garage if you're so inclined and if you have a lot of free time. A kit plane 
first flew in 1979. It's one of the more popular models in the Vans RV family. Decent aerobatic performance, as you can see, but it's also an ideal tourer. Two seats, rumbles and bags, a cruise speed of 200 miles an hour, 600 miles of range, and a service ceiling of 23,000 feet, although it does have an unpressurised cockpit, so I don't imagine many Vans owners will be taking their aircraft up that high very often. Now the aircraft about to split. And a brief display of synchronised aerobatics. on our wide angle camera they're very neatly reforming one aircraft performing a barrel roll then a loop the other performing a loop then a barrel roll and exiting their respective maneuvers immediately returning to loose formation and now bearing down upon each other to get back in close formation again for another barrel roll. M2K Music and Aviation asks, did I hear there is a discount code for the subscription site? Yes, there is. The code is Bournemouth with a capital B, 50% off your first month. Actually, the uh, discount code also gives you 50% off the annual plan. Uh, if you feel so inclined, that will give you access to our on-demand service uh, with our back catalogue of programmes stretching all the way back to 1989, plus our live broadcast tomorrow from Bournemouth and some of our future pay-per-view live streams as well. Well, now the aircraft pitching up into what's known as a quarter clover. This is a loop with a rolling component to it on the upline. The aircraft twisting towards us and about to split as they come over the top. And then what we call half Cubans out to the left and right, synchronized, two-thirds of a loop, then half a roll and a recovery back to level flight. And the aircraft will bear down upon each other very rapidly. Smoke system coming into its own here, not just adding visual appeal to us on the ground, but also an important safety mechanism allowing the aircraft and the pilots rather to pick out each other visually. smoke system works by, uh, well it's a, it's a secondary tank, in addition to the fuel tank there's a secondary tra tank which uh, uh, normally sits in the back of the cockpit behind the seats and uh, it's filled with environmentally friendly smoke oil, uh, often Ondina is the product that's being used, very expensive, more expensive than uh, Avgas and then uh, from there there's a pump and a little tube down to the exhaust turn the pump on, it feeds some of that smoke oil slowly into the exhaust of the engine uh, where it vaporises in the hot exhaust and forms the smoke trails that we see here. So the aircraft flying quarter clovers once again a loop, there's the rolling component on the way up, and then both aircraft coming over the top to exit to our centre. A very neat way of getting the two aircraft back into a loose formation. 
and then they will pull up into the vertical for synchronized stall turns. So uh, perhaps we'll show you this on our wide angle camera so you can see both of them. There we go. Aircraft pulling up into the vertical, speed bleeding away, kicking in that left rudder and the aircraft pivot round that left wingtip in order to come back towards us. And now we'll follow a short tail chase sequence. I think we're expecting to see some caterpillar loops here. So both aircraft looping simultaneously, but in loose formation, one behind the other. Yeah, there they go. Seeing it very nicely on our wide angle camera there. Two identical circles being created next to each other in the sky. Deceptively difficult. even just to fly a circular loop there's uh, a lot more going on than meets the eye if you hold the stick back at a constant position you will create a loop that uh, is rather tall and narrow because of that lower airspeed over the top in order to, to round the loop out there needs to be less forward stick over the top of the loop less back stick sorry I should say to extend that inverted portion. But now the team pulling up at show centre and splitting to draw a heart. And so concludes our display by the Firebirds. That is actually us done for around an hour or so, the end of the first block of flying displays here. To answer some questions in the chat about what is coming up. We have already had the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight and the Typhoon, although the Typhoon is coming back later on. Still to come in our second batch of flying starting at 3 o'clock, we have the Tutor, the Chinook, Yak-50, Rolls-Royce Heritage Flight with Spitfire and Mustang, Navy Wings with the Swordfish and Wasp, the Starlings Aerobatic Team, Rich Goodwin in the pits, S to S with added jet engines and then at five o'clock well the stars of the show the many I'm sure the red arrows
walking around asking if we've got any First World War military aircraft being flown today. Not here at Bournemouth. We have seen plenty of that earlier this season. We had uh, Duxford Flying Day in July, which had uh, some First World War, replica First World War aircraft. We broadcast that live free on YouTube. And then uh, the Duxford Summer Air Show in June, we had the Great War Display Team. And I can't remember exactly how many aircraft there were uh, in the air, but a, a real melee of at least half a dozen First World War fighters all up at the same time. Pyrotechnics, smoke, it made for quite a spectacle. running through the running order for that uh, second batch of flying starting in about an hour's time but we do have an evening show as well in fact I wonder if uh, possibly Andrew might be able to play out some shots of yesterday's evening show that will start at around about 20 past 7 as far as I remember and will include aircraft such as the RAF Typhoon FGR4, the Spitfire PR19. Well, there's the Typhoon from yesterday. Oh, stunning conditions that we had last night. Sun just peeking through a gap in the clouds as it started to set. Uh, plenty of vapour, as you can see. So hoping for more of the same tonight. And the reheat standing in so well. The reheat actually lighting up those vapour clouds there. Magical stuff. In addition to that, the Spitfire PR-19 I mentioned also due to fly in the night show. The Firebirds that we just witnessed will be coming back, but this time with fireworks on the wingtips. And a real highlight for many. Otto the helicopter. Two and a half thousand firework effects will be launched from Otto during that display. It is absolute insanity. Stefan asks, why is G-Spark the only one with ADS-B turned on? That is quite normal for formations of aircraft. Um, remember, one of the roles of air traffic control is deconfliction uh, of aircraft. And if you've got two aircraft uh, in formation, both uh, with their transponders turned on, then uh, air traffic control could panic and try to uh, separate them. So what will normally happen is... Uh, they will operate under the call sign formation. In this case, uh, probably uh, Golf Romeo Kilo formation. And that would indicate to air traffic control that although only one aircraft is transponding, there is more than one up there with it. Mac One Media asks, is there an evening show tomorrow? No, there won't be an evening show tomorrow. There is a full, uh, uninterrupted day show with no breaks, uh, featuring uh, all of the favourites that we've been witnessing over the last few days, Red Arrows, Typhoon, and so on. And that live broadcast from tomorrow will be available exclusively to our YouTube channel members and to paying subscribers to our on-demand video service watch.planestv.com if you want to subscribe to that there is a 50% discount available head to watch.planestv.com and use the code Bournemouth with a capital B so I think what I'm going to do now unless Ian desperately wants to speak to you all is probably uh, ask Andrew to uh, mute my microphone for a little bit and have a short break for some lunch. Uh, but as I said, the flying due to resume at around about three o'clock and so many stars of the show are still to come.
technically a big advert for uh, Plains TV channel. Well, welcome back to our, our Plains TV live coverage of the Bournemouth Air Festival where we are now just 15 minutes away from the resumption of the flying display, which will be resuming with the Royal Air Force Grob Tutor, but still so many other highlights still to come, uh, chief among them the Royal Air Force aerobatic team, the Red Arrows, uh, coming up at 5 o'clock, and of course all of the evening shows later on. And we're enjoying all of this from a really spectacular vantage point uh, on the roof of the Cumberland Hotel. Well, yes, we've been coming to Bournemouth for ooh, 10, 11, 12 years now, and uh, the great thing about Bournemouth, so you've still got a day to come if you're fairly nearby is you've got these huge cliffs uh, but we've not just got a huge cliff we've got a huge hotel which gets us so high uh, that quite often we're looking down on the aircraft that are displaying and to get a bit of ground reference I mean that typhoon uh, earlier today and uh, yesterday in particular I think somebody might have spoken to him because uh, since the first one on Friday evening he's been a little bit higher today <laughs> so uh, maybe someone had a word uh, but it is great looking down um, yep. and ground reference when you're filming. I'm sorry, I'm an anorak. Uh, it is, is great. So yep. the high. So thank you very much, Cumberland Hotel, yep. for hosting us. And if you want to enjoy the same view that uh, we've been having over the last few days, then uh, it's probably a bit late for this year's air festival. But for future air festivals, there are rooms available facing out towards the sea. And there's also daytime hospitality down uh, by the pool below. Uh, there's what sounded last night like a, a rather fun pool party with a live band and lots of food and what a great way to enjoy a Red Arrows display. Absolutely. And if you do come to the Cumberland Hotel, do say that you heard about them from Plains TV. Yeah, and why then, not? Uh, uh, and then maybe they'll say, oh, when we ask to come back next year, oh, yes, you're the one that brought us 17 people for overnight stays, 27 people to eat and a few rounds of drinks. <laughs> There's another organisation we need to say thank you to as well, and this is really your area of expertise, so uh, I'll let you take over here. Well, well, I cut my teeth as a 8, 9, 10-year-old building airfix kits, and uh, I've always been a, being a big fan of airfix and, uh, and Hornby with the other interests. And, uh, yeah, we've got um, a sponsorship of a sort from Hornby uh, helping us to do the stream this weekend. Uh, Hornby. I'm always saying Hornby. It's airfix. Prod me if I say Hornby. <laughs> I'll, I'll but it's the same group, that. same group yeah. of companies. Uh, Airfix, it's tremendous. And, and what is great about Airfix is they still seem to have the appeal to youngsters, you know, the eight, nine, ten year olds like me 60 odd years ago. Uh, and just seeing today where uh, you go into their tent and they give you a kit to build on the, prim on the premises. Mm. They give you the paint, they give you the paint brushes, they uh, give you the glue. Right in saying it's free as well. And it's free, absolutely. Uh, it's in the town centre uh, by the old Debenhams building. So uh, if anybody is within. Uh, Travelling distance of Bournemouth, and you fancy a free airfix kit, and uh, having a go at building a Red Arrows Hawk. That's what they're actually doing at the moment, or, or were earlier. Yep, um, well, uh, you've, and, you've got a little video uh, of it. They're trying so. to get youngsters uh, into airfix kits. Yeah. Well, let's have a look at that uh, video that you recorded at the airfix stand yesterday. Hi everyone, my name's James. I'm here at Bournemouth Air Festival with Airfix. Please come down and say hello. We're currently building three Red Arrows Hawks, also with all the glue, paint and everything included. Um, so if you're watching, please come down, please say hello and enjoy the Air Festival. We've been building these three Red Arrows from Airfix and you can paint them and you can glue them together like this one. That's nearly complete. We just have this little part here to put back on, on the wing. We do indeed. And we're also here with our shop. And some of our best deals here are uh, quick builds, which are two for 25 pounds. And over there we have our starter sets at 10 pound each. To find Airfix at Bournemouth this weekend, we're currently outside the old Debenhams building. Over here. spotted in the distance one of the display aircraft that we'll be seeing very shortly taken to the air from Bournemouth Airport, uh, the Chinook. Um, so as I say we're now about 10 minutes from the resumption of flying activities. We are here uh, for the duration of the Bournemouth Air Festival. Tomorrow's stream you will need to pay a little bit of money for. You will either need to be a YouTube channel member uh, or you will need to have subscribed to our on-demand video service watch.planestv.com and uh, Adrian's always happy to introduce that. Well, you'll have to forgive us for that. I mean, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could do live streams for free all the time? But wouldn't it be wonderful if we run a restaurant where we give free food out all the time? Um, we're a commercial operation. We need to feed each other and 
stay in hotels and drive and it's a commercial business we need an income uh, and it is our watch.planestv.com side that earns us our income it's a subscription channel but the amount of stuff to see on there is extraordinary uh, here for example are two DVDs that we made a few years ago and uh, there's a double DVD British Air Shows we Made that, made that series since 1989, so there's, oh, what, 20, 30 of those. European air shows we made for, what, six, seven, eight years. They're both double DVDs. These cost £25 each if they're still in stock. £50. But for that same £50, you can watch everything we've ever made for a whole year on watch.plaincv.com. It's not quite true because some of the stuff we've not uploaded yet, yep. but we're, uh, in, the process uh, of we're in the process of, and uh, if anybody sees a product that, that we used to sell and want to see it on watch, just, just bung us an email and um, it goes further up the queue. But it's chalk and cheese. I mean, what would you spend? 20, 50 pounds on that, or would you spend 50 pounds to watch 300 like this mm. on the channel? And in better quality. So yep. if these are DV, DVDs... Yeah, standard definition. Um, uh, I mean, blu ray is the better quality, but what we have on the channel is effectively Blu-ray quality. Mm. So it's a great deal. Yep. And, and that's what earns us our income. So uh, if anybody, it's half price at the moment, £50 yep. pounds if, you go, if you buy it a year. Uh, and uh, come on, come on, folks. Spend £50 pounds and, and stay with us for a whole year. Uh, watch the Battle of Britain show at Duxford yes, in a couple of weeks' Yes, and coming up in time. two weeks' time, we've got the Duxford Battle of Britain air show. We're live streaming that exclusively on watch.planestv.com. And I'm going to mention three particular highlights. The big wing formation, at least 12 Spitfires and four Hurricanes. That's going to be amazing. A formation of B-17 and Lancaster. Yeah. Oh, looking forward to that. Absolutely. And two more days of the Red Arrows. Yeah. What's not to like? And six, six weeks or so ago, we were live broadcasting the Royal International Air Tattoo, Riyadh. And uh, that is available to view uh, on our channel. So all three days, w watch, watch it all from start to finish. Yes, indeed. Or and scroll along the timeline and pick your, pick your favourite aircraft. Yep, and if you don't want to do that, then we will be distilling that roughly 60 hours of live broadcasting into a, a two-and-a-half-hour edited programme. It's going to feature the best of the action from the whole week. That will come out probably late autumn, early winter, uh, and will be available, again, exclusively on watch.planestv.com. Equivalent to the old souvenir DVDs. And besides the, uh, the DVDs that we've got on the channel, uh, there are other live streams that we've done in the past that you can see on watch.plainstv.com. Yep. So Farnborough is the obvious one. We live stream that. So what, what, six days? It starts on a Monday, ends on a Sunday. Six days of Farnborough live stream. Uh, they're not all there, but a heck of a lot of them are. Um, so it isn't just the original DVDs videos. It, it's the live streams that we've done in the past. It, it, it's, go it's like going into a sweet shop with hundreds of jars of sweets but no labels on them so you have to dip into them because searching for what you want on the channel is, is a bit hard at the minute the best thing to do is actually go into the shop side of of our website and look for the product in the shop it'll probably say sold out because we're talking dvds but it will give you a big list of what what's in the program and a, and a sleeve picture and uh, a, a notes about the show. So I've got a challenge for you. Um, <laughs> earlier on, right. you asked people to name their, oh, their favourite air show moments. They have been, been continuing to do this. You're and joking. you said oh, no. you reckon you would have them all on, uh, on DVDs. Go so on, here are a few things that this, people this, were yeah, We haven't practiced this, We I haven't promise. practiced this, um, and I genuinely don't know if we have them oh, all. Dear, but got me scared now. Buccaneer displays. Oh, Best you, Buccaneer display you've ever filmed, go. Uh, Lake and Neath 1992. Easy. I mean, I mean, just sitting on the deck. But but when the Buccaneers finished in 1993, we had a fabulous couple of days with them. We went up the, the, uh, the C-130 Hercules doing air-to-air, -air, and they put the hunters up as well um, that were training the Buccaneer pilots. So, uh, yeah, we had a great um, a few days with the Buccaneers when they were finishing. But uh, cause the Buccaneer was a very regular air show act in... 89, 90, 91, 92 yeah. and we filmed it many, many times but the one I remember is it literally sweeping in with smoke coming out of its space and then doing that, that low level run um, uh, at Lake Neath, uh, the American Air Force Base in 1992 Right, next. Next one and this is the last one because okay. I've heard George Bacon has just started commentating right. again so very quickly, Blue Angels Best filming of the Blue yes, Angels? Yes, Blue Angels I, 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 Has anybody seen the Blue Angels? I mean I have to say oh no, I won't, I won't go on air saying that <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, Blue Angels. Uh, we they have been to the UK, um, but the only day they flew in the UK, which we did film, the weather was atrocious. It was at Finningley in 1990, 
Yeah, they've only um, been back to Europe once since then, which was right. New Ward in 2006. That, that's right. But we have filmed them at Fort Worth. We filmed them at El Toro uh, and also uh, USA. Where was it? Was it, uh, was it Dayton? Um, uh, Air Show's 99, that's uh, right. It's probably Air Show's 99 and Air Show's 98. What I do remember is the JATO C-130, mm. uh, the rocket-assisted takeoff. Yeah. Uh, that's a bit special to yeah, see. Yeah, and a thing of the past. Um, I, I, I mean, they're, they're not the world's best aerobatic team. We'll have that argument. With you. If you want to know the world's <laughs> no, best... No, I'm not going to argue with you. <laughs> Adam won't tell you the world's worst aerobatic no, team. We've had this conversation. No. But uh, Adam is past master on aerobatic teams. Yeah. I've, uh, I've, they're great, and to see a big super sonic jet like that rock solid in the sky mm. and uh, I remember one bit I've got time to say I knew that the solo was going to come by at, at 20 foot off the ground at near supersonic speed at, at, at great noise while everybody was looking at the four in the sky so I set my camera up on this little family group my remote camera uh, and I got this guy coming in really low and fast and then I and then of course as soon as this little family group were <laughs> so you know the, the, the poor little eight-year-old was screaming and crying and it was such the wrong thing to do you know US Navy but it's surprise and that's yeah. a military tactic yeah and it's part of the demonstration and to see that F-18 coming in at that speed off the deck I can see it now on our video and that would have been 1998 that would have been so probably El Toro probably El Toro mm. which was the last air show at El Toro mm. We went to it. I don't have Air Shows 98. I have Air Shows 99, and that's one of my favourites. It might have been 97, but uh, we've got it. We've got it. Blue Angels, there you go. Well, Ian's pointing his camera out to sea. I'm starting to wonder if he's picked up a distant Grob tutor. Um, he has, I'm told, in my ear, so I think it's probably time to... Uh... Well, the tutor comes at us on the B-axis and Ian's not pointing at the B-axis. But uh, We will saunter to our cameras. We'll and uh, to cameras and I'm going to get um, my notes out. Please, those of you who have a few pound notes in your pocket, using the code Bournemouth on the watch.planestv.com channel, you get a year for half price, £50, or a month for half price, £5. Yep. I mean, I mean, that, that's a bargain, because in your first month, you're going to get the Duxford Battle of Britain Air Show as well. It's a no-brainer. And look at all the reacts we've just had. Yep. Right, I think it's tutor time. So we are just a few moments out from the start of the uh, Tutor solo display, the aircraft repositioning out in front of us. It runs in on the B axis, that is the line that comes in straight in towards us. If we've got any American aficionados joining us, then uh, it is what's known as the Y axis in America. What you call the uh, X and the Y, we call the A and the B. And a huge thank you to Paul Sargent, who has just gifted us £20. Thank you so much. That is incredibly generous of you. It all helps uh, cover the cost of this weekend's stream and encourage us to go out and do more of this kind of thing. So running in towards us, here is the Grob Tutor, and you can see on uh, Ian's lovely tight shot there, even though the aircraft is quite distant, um, that unusual yellow and black colour scheme, experimental colour scheme applied a few years ago, very similar to the one we saw from the Firefly earlier. Now this, this is a display of energy management. The aircraft starting off at 700 feet, gradually 
working its way down to about 300 feet by the end of the display. And these first manoeuvres that we see are relatively high energy manoeuvres, slowly burning through height. The second half of the display is energy neutral manoeuvres, all performed at about 300 feet. That's a bit lower than uh, this year's display pilot has been allowed to fly in the past. It's Flight Lieutenant David John Gibbs, and for last season, he had an aerobatic altitude minima of 500 feet, reduced to 300 for this season. And here comes a stall turn. The Tutor T1 is the RAF designation for the Grob 115E, a carbon composite general aviation aircraft developed in Germany, which first flew in 1985. Although primarily designed as a civilian aircraft, the Grob 115 has numerous military operators. They include the air forces of Bangladesh, Finland, Egypt, Kenya, the UAE, and of course our own Royal Air Force and Royal Navy. Here the aircraft transcribing the shape of a horizontal figure of eight, a manoeuvre known as a Cuban eight. We've seen plenty of half Cubans today. Well, this is two half Cubans strung together. The tutor entered RAF service in 1999 with the Central Flying School replacing the Scottish Aviation Bulldog as the RAF's elementary flying trainer. 99 tutors were ordered, making the RAF by far the largest military tutor operator. Today, the tutor has been replaced in the elementary flight training ro role by a more modern derivative, the Prefect T1, also known as the Grob 120. The Prefect has more than double the power of the tutor, with, an eight, with a 380 shaft horsepower Rolls-Royce turboprop engine rather than 180 horsepower Lycoming, as we see in this tutor. That gives the Prefect a much higher climb rate, top speed and service ceiling. The Prefect is also equipped with a full glass cockpit, making it better equipped to train future Typhoon and F-35 pilots. Despite that, the tutor remains highly relevant in today's Royal Air Force. That's largely because there are only 23 Prefects in British service, shared between the Air Force, Army and Navy. The RAF has approximately 90 tutors on strength, and while they have been retired from the elementary flight training role, they are still used by 15 university air squadrons and 13 air experience flights, as well as by the number six flight training school at RAF Wittering. This aircraft comes from 115 Squadron, which is part of the number six flight training school. That squadron is responsible for providing training for flight instructors, as well as for providing tutor, dis tutor displays at air shows. What a lovely job they do with these air displays. I love these display sequences, not least because they are so well constructed. There is not a dull moment. Every manoeuvre flows seamlessly into the next, and it's difficult to tell where one ends and the next starts. Now, coming up in just a moment, we've got a very interesting opportunity to see how the tutor handles in various planes of flight with a four-point hesitation roll. Hesitation roll. So you're going to see the aircraft pitching up quite abruptly before the roll, and then in the knife edge phase, the nose will start to slice downwards. That pitch up at the beginning of the roll being used 
to account for the altitude loss in the knife edge phase. So there's the pitch, there's the knife edge portion. Nose slicing down, rolling inverted, now in level flight, bit of uh, forward stick pushing to maintain altitude. Knife edge phase again, nose really slicing down now. Quite a steep downward attitude as the aircraft then recovers, rolls erect and pitches up into a wing over to reposition out to our right. And this time it will be for a more conventional roll. But still, plenty of altitude loss entailed if you were to execute this in level flight in a high lift aircraft like the Tutor. So a notable pitch up there as the roll commences. This year's display pilot is Flight Lieutenant David John Gibbs. He's in his second and final year flying Tutor displays. He previously flew for the Royal Navy, flying Sea Kings, but transferred to the RAF Tutor fleet in 2019. In the civilian world, he's involved in the operation of classic jets. important part of the RAF's outreach because for many of the younger spectators in the crowd here today this is the most tangible RAF asset this is the one that they would be flying in if they joined the University Air Squadron or the Air Cadets such a powerful thing to be able to point at an aircraft and say you could do that maybe not tomorrow but in a few months it is eminently achievable you could do that So final pass coming up from the tutor and yesterday this was a very steep ring, wing rock indeed all the way to about 90 degrees angle of bank. It made for quite dramatic viewing. Let's see if we get the same again. I imagine that we will. Yeah. Thank you to Flight Lieutenant David John Gibbs for that fantastic display. And we go from one Royal Air Force asset to another because somewhere out to sea is a Chinook HC-6A. It is out there dead in front of us at the moment, but very distant. Like the tutor, the Chinook will be arriving on the B axis directly towards us. If you ever have seen this show at uh, an airfield venue, then it's quite a dramatic arrival because he usually arrives uh, appearing below the, uh, the, the height of the trees and foliage until he's really quite close. 
and then pitches up for a pedal turn. Just about here, the sound of some very distant blade slap now as the Chinook is coming in towards us. The RAF is the largest export customer for the Chinook, the second largest operator of the Chinook behind the US Army. The bulk of the fleet is made up of aging but upgraded HC6As like this one. We also operate the HC6, the HC5, and are soon to take deliveries of the Chinook Block 2, the first overseas customer for the Block 2 Chinook. Those models I mentioned, if you are more familiar with the American designations, they are equivalent to the CH-47D, MH-47E uh, MH and CH-47F. And that uh, Block 2 Chinook is known in America as the H-47ER, optimised for special operations. That order was announced a couple of years ago with the first aircraft due to arrive in 2026. The Chinook is used primarily for trooping, resupply and battlefield casualty evacuation. But it can also carry large loads, both internally and externally, capable of carrying its own weight from hooks on the outside of the fuselage. It can also carry up to 55 troops or 10 tonnes of cargo. traditional war fighting roles, the Chinook's lifting capability is very much utilised during emergencies here in the UK. In recent years that has included resupplying snowbound farmers in Northern Ireland and moving tonnes of aggregate to help reconstruct flood defences damaged during winter storms. In August 2019, a Chinook was instrumental in securing a dam on the Toddbrook Reservoir after it became structurally unsound following heavy rain. I remember that news story very well. About to see a manoeuvre now demonstrating the Chinook's manoeuvrability. 50 degrees pitch up and then 50 degrees pitch down. This is the roller coaster. During that manoeuvre we heard something that is uh, called blade slap, that distinctive slapping sound that Chinook seems to generate so re readily. That is caused when one rotor blade passes through the tip vortex of another blade and that's why it's so common with the Chinook. There's those two large rotor heads which are so often passing through each other's vortices, especially when the aircraft is pitching. We're going to have another nose over now, this time from right to left. This and out for that blade slap.
displaying the Chinook is a true team effort. The pilot only looks outside the cockpit, and it is the co-pilot's job to call out air speeds and heights to the pilot. It's all the more important at overwater displays such as this one, where it's so hard to judge height visually because of the lack of visual reference points. For all that reason, seaside displays in the UK have a blanket altitude minima of 100 feet, even for pilots who are normally permitted to fly lower than that. So the Chinook executing a pedal turn out to our left. And will now perform what would normally be called a wing rock. Of course, no wings on this aircraft. Perhaps we can say a, a rotor rock instead. Maneuver that we first saw last year. The nose down quick stop previously performed on the A axis from left to right, but now being performed with energy towards the spectators. And isn't that a dramatic shot there? Here's the quick stop. An excellent demonstration of the Chinook's ability to tra transition from high speed into the hover. We'll be seeing another quick stop later on today. But now it's time for the Chinook to pass from left to right. Look out for a pair of big orange hands waving from the rear loading ramp. Waving from the aircraft and waving from the ground as well. So coming up in a few seconds time we have a rather interesting manoeuvre developed in real life combat called the Gorney Corkscrew. This is a very special tactical climb that was used to take off from a specific combat zone in a narrow valley at a Chinook landing site in Bosnia. You see the Chinook has machine guns on three sides. At the doors on the left and right and on the rear ramp. But there's no forward-facing armaments. And in this narrow, steep-sided valley, there could be enemies with light arms in any direction. So by rotating during the climb, the Chinook could make sure that every single part of its surroundings was covered by machine guns most of the time. That is what we are about to see demonstrated. The Chinook starting the climb, and there's the rotation. This is the Gorney Corkscrew. up pass coming up next another good chance to hear the blade slap and next up we have a very different sort of quick stop 
to the one we saw earlier. You might remember the nose down quick stop involved the aircraft rotating very rapidly through 180 degrees uh, in order to uh, counteract its own forward momentum. This time we're going to see a straight and level pit, uh, quick stop. The aircraft pitching nose high using the lift created by its enormous rotor blades to arrest its forward momentum and bring it to a halt at show centre. So approaching from the right at high speed. And the nose about to come up. Now comes really quite nose high for that final deceleration into the hover. We're coming to the end of the Chinook display, just one more manoeuvre to go, and this is another one very much inspired by real life combat techniques. The Chinook were, landed, were leaving a landing site with a threat from in front. It would conduct this, an over the shoulder departure, the purpose being to expose the armour plating on the bottom of the Chinook to that incoming arms fire rather than the more vulnerable cockpit. And that over-the-shoulder departure completes the 2023 Royal Air Force Chinook solo display. Lovely to see so many pleasure craft out enjoying the uh, wonderful weather and the flying displays today, all sitting just outside the exclusion zone that very sensibly exists under, this, under the display area. Similar regulations to uh, air displays held over land where there needs to be this uh, sterile display area. And we've seen, actually, in recent years, several air displays postponed and one even cancelled as a result of maritime traffic making its way into the, into the exclusion zone. It's being very well policed today. And uh, well marked by those boys that you can see in the picture as well. So as the Chinook clears out to our front, Ian is now uh, looking out for our next display item, which is going to be a Yak-50 flown by Paul Farmer, an aircraft and pilot that formerly operated as part of the Yakovlev's aerobatic team, sadly defunct. Currently holding off to our left, but shortly to run in. And uh, it's a great shame that we aren't able to see the full Yakovlev's formation displays at British Air Shows anymore. They were planning a farewell season in 2023. They had a couple of six-ship display plan displays planned. They'd never actually flown as a six-ship in the UK before, despite being uh, based here. And they were hoping to do a six-ship at the Midlands Air Festival, among at least a couple of others. But uh, to date, all of their six ships have been uh, either in France or China. A great display, and uh, very sorry not to have been able to have the chance to see it one last time. But sadly, it was decided that the team would disband a year earlier than planned. That was due to the collapse of several business opportunities in the Middle East, combined with the generally increasing cost and complexity of running a large formation aerobatic team. The entire team and their assets are up for sale, so if you want to invest in a ready-made airshow team, you can do. You'll be opening yourself up to a whole world of pain, though. I'd love someone to do it, but I can't say it sounds advisable. Nonetheless, solo display by Paul Farmer. Also very enjoyable. Quite unusual that we do see Yak 50 solo displays here in the UK. We have seen a few Yaks on the circuit flying formation displays. The Yak of Levs, as I mentioned earlier, we've got Yak 52s and a Yak 18T from the Flying Comrades. There's a defunct Yak team called the Cossacks as well, but relatively rare to see a solo.
Well, there is the Yak in the distance doing some display warm-up. A couple of things that could be going on there. It could be G-warming. Paul just getting into the mood, warming up his body and muscles and activating that muscle memory for tensing up during the high G manoeuvres. It could also be a little bit of a shakedown for safety purposes. Uh, I know there are some pilots who like to take off, roll the aircraft upside down, shake the wings about a little bit just to make sure there's no loose articles in the cockpit. Make sure the aircraft is handling as expected before running into a, a low-level, high-performance aerobatic routine. So it would have been one of those two things that we just saw a glimpse of there, possibly both. But as you can see, while the aircraft is inbound, still some distance to cover yet. Today's display is flown for us by Paul Farmer. He's an ex-Royal Air Force Chinook pilot. He now flies search and rescue missions for His Majesty's Coast Guard. He has extensive air show experience, though, having displayed the Chinook at air shows in 2012 and 2013. He joined the Yakovlevs in 2018, and he also serves as a Flying Control Committee member and display authorization examiner. Smoke now on for the start of what was yesterday a very graceful solo aerobatic routine. We no longer really see yaks demonstrated to their full potential because this was an aircraft that had a remarkably short service life. It was a purpose-built competition aerobatics machine loosely based on the post-war Soviet Yak-18 trainer developed in the Soviet Union in the 1970s. It was used extensively by the Soviet aerobatic team at top-level aerobatic competitions. It made its competitive debut at the 1976 World Aerobatic Championships in Kyiv. And during that debut competition, the Yak-50 made quite an impression because it finished first and second in the men's competition and in the women's competition, it finished first, second, third, fourth, and fifth. The Yak-50 then won the World Aerobatic Championships for a second time in 1982. That being said, Yak-50s used at that level were subjected to such enormous stress that they were retired, often after just 50 flight hours. Soviet pilots pushed the aircraft to their limits and sometimes beyond. It is a remarkable fact to me that any aircraft could be built with the intention of only flying it for a few hours, but such is the level of performance and the amount of stress that was imposed on these machines. Some of them, however, were not scrapped, and they managed to escape into the civilian market. It is estimated today that around 70 Yak-50s survive and fly in private hands, most of them our aircraft, formerly of the Soviet National Aerobatic Team, that managed to somehow escape being scrapped. Of course, we're much more used to seeing the twin-seat version, the Yak-52, uh, at air shows in the UK and around the world, and indeed in military operation to this day. It's broadly speaking the same airframe, 
but with a larger two-seat tandem layout cockpit. It's got tricycle undercarriage as well because it was designed for the training role. And given most contemporary aircraft have tricycle undercarriage rather than being tail draggers, it was decided that it was beneficial to equip the Yak-52 with that tricycle configuration landing gear rather than maintaining the tail dragger layout of the Yak-50 made it much more suitable as a training aircraft, especially in military service. There's no frontline military aircraft anymore with tail wheels. It could be fitted with a large number of power plants, this Yak-50, with varying amounts of output between 360 and 450 horsepower. And that makes it considerably more powerful than many top-tier aerobatic aircraft in use today. But then remember that this is an all-metal design, so it is rather heavier than some of the composite machines that we see at contemporary aerobatic competitions, like the Extra 300 family. Lovely way from the cockpit during that topside pass, which concludes that Yak 50 solo by Paul Farmer. And as Paul departs off to our left, I'd like to take this opportunity to say hello and welcome to anyone who's just recently joined us here on Plains TV for our live coverage of the Bournemouth Air Festival. We are here all four days, albeit not much flu on the first of those four days. And if you want to uh, join us again tomorrow, we shall be broadcasting the entire show. But you will need to pay us a little bit of money, I'm afraid. Tomorrow's broadcast will be available to channel members and to subscribers to our on-demand streaming service, watch.planestv.com. Matt Hurst says, got to say, love this stream. Well done, better view than if I was down there in the crowds. Well, yes, that's because we're up here on the roof of the Cumberland Hotel. We're very kindly hosting us for a second year. We are five floors up and on top of the cliffs as well, so quite some elevation compared to uh, the height of the water. But if you do want this view, you can have it, uh, because come future Bournemouth Air Festivals, 
You can book yourself into the Cumberland Hotel. They have rooms out uh, beneath us facing the sea. Some uh, lovely fourth, four, fourth floor suites uh, offering, well, an identical view to what we're showing you now. If you don't want to fork out for overnight accommodation, they also have day hospitality. And we've been uh, watching below us at points. A uh, bit of a pool party. They've got a swimming pool down uh, on the patio below, a restaurant. They've had live music. Yeah, you can see it in some of these shots that we're showing you at the moment. Lovely facilities and a really great atmosphere. What a wonderful way that would be to uh, watch a Red Arrows display rather than being up here on the roof working. We do love it, though. This is the first of several live streams that we have coming up in uh, very short order obviously Bournemouth this weekend next weekend we are live broadcasting for free here on YouTube the air show festival of flight up in Scotland then a few days after that again free on YouTube the Jersey International Air Display that's going to be a great show featuring the Red Arrows and the Patrie de France following on from that just a few days later we're providing cameras for the official live broadcast of NATO days in Ostrava uh, but we are also broadcasting the Duxford Battle of Britain Air Show 2023 12 Spitfires, 4 Hurricanes, a huge number of other warbirds, B-17 and Lancaster flying in formation, the Red Arrows as well. That will be going out exclusively on watch.planestv.com. And then in October, we will be bringing you free on YouTube the Duxford flying finale. I don't think there's any aircraft list that's been published for that yet. Angus asks, what was my first ever air show? Hmm, I think my first ever air show was in about 2000 2005, 2006. And my neighbours had some spare tickets to a Shuttleworth Collection evening show and uh, took me to that. I barely remember it. My, my only memory, I was very young at the time, my only memory really was of an aircraft starting up very close to the crowd line and blowing some deck chairs over. I, know I also went to uh, a fairly early Duxford air show. It would have been around the same time. didn't get to stay for all of it. The people I was there with decided we needed to leave before the end to beat the traffic and we missed the uh, Spitfire finale. That's my only real memory of that. But again, I was very young. Go on, tell us in the chat, what was, uh, what was your first air show, Angus? And anyone else? Well, coming up very shortly... After that seagull departs the frame, uh, we've got a lovely display coming up next. The Rolls-Royce Heritage Flight for the Spitfire and Mustang. And something of a new innovation for the 2023 season. We used to get consecutive solo displays from these aircraft, but both pilots have now qualified with formation display authorizations. That allows them to open their show with a brief two-ship formation sequence. The slot time is around two minutes from now. I'd like to say a special hello to uh, Andy T, who's just joined the chat and uh, was part of our team for the Royal International Air Tattoo. Angus Cooper's first show was Woodford 2000. Time to go, Riyadh 2011. Ooh, Riyadh 2011, that had some interesting acts. Was that the UK debut of the Saudi Hawks? And I uh, remember US Air Force A-10 was there that year as well. Well, let's stop talking about the air shows of old and talk about some aeroplanes of old because coming in now from the right here is the Rolls-Royce Heritage Flight.
this organization set up to recognize the history of Rolls-Royce. Two of their finest engines represented here, the Merlin in the Mustang and the Griffin in this late model Spitfire. An interesting contrast in sound, the much deeper, throatier growl of the Griffin is really quite notable here. The Rolls-Royce Heritage Flight own this Spitfire. They don't own the Mustang, but they do have permission to operate it at air shows over the summer. It's actually owned by Warbird, Warbird Experiences at Biggin Hill. The Mustang departs to our right and will return to us later on, but out to our left, the Spitfire repositions for its solo display. This is a Spitfire PR-19, one of the final marks of Spitfire. PR stands for photo reconnaissance, and that's an indication of the role that it performed. to a Mark I Spitfire with a Rolls-Royce Merlin engine. The Griffin engine Spitfire Mark 19 has 3.5 times more fuel capacity and twice as much power. Thanks to the more powerful engine and pressurized cabin, it could fly it up to 40,000 feet and had a top speed of over 400 knots. Despite that impressive performance, by 1944, the Spitfire was due for replacement. Supermarine proposed an aircraft called the Spiteful, a new Griffin engine fighter based loosely on the Spitfire Mark 14, but with a redesigned wing and a larger tail for better performance at high speed and improved stability. The RAF ordered 200 Spitefuls, but the project was cancelled before any of them had been delivered, as it was starting to become clear that jet-powered fighter aircraft were the future.
But those jets weren't ready quite yet, so as a stopgap, Supermarine instead delivered 79 Mark 19 Spitfires. This is one of them. It was delivered to the Central Photographic Reconnaissance Unit at Benson in January 1945. She served in mainland Europe until the war ended, then returned to Britain and was selected for conversion from a photo reconnaissance platform to a meteorological research aircraft. After a brief spell in civilian ownership, flying with the Short Brothers Meteorological Research Flight, she returned to the RAF in 1957 as one of the three founding Spitfires of the unit that would, of the unit that would become the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight. And that was the first of two stints with the BBMF. It's the first time she only remained with them for a few months before then being passed around several other RAF stations and eventually ending up as a gate guardian in West Raynham. That didn't last either and within a year she'd been restored back to flying condition, continued to move around various RAF stations and then rejoined the BBMF in 1964. Now, a rather dramatic manoeuvre. The aircraft comes in straight towards us on the B-axis and pitches up for a half Cuban. Lovely opportunity to see the plan form of that gorgeous elliptical wing. And another energy on crowd manoeuvre coming up next. So many of my favourite air show moments are these energy on crowd manoeuvres. The aircraft repositioning on the left 45 degree line is going to roll out straight towards us and then pitch up into a wing over onto the right 45 degree line borderline aerobatic, it's nearly a barrel roll. This aircraft's second spell with the BBMF lasted rather longer than the first. It was in their service until 1995 when it was sold onto the civilian market and became part of the Rolls-Royce Heritage Flight. Today it's painted up as an aircraft of number 16 photographic reconnaissance squadron of the 2nd Tactical Air Force. In now for a final pass and as with most Spitfire displays well they only really end one way don't they? It's got to be a victory roll to end the show. now from the Spitfire to the Mustang, an aircraft originally developed in response to a 1940 British request for a new American fighter for the Royal Air Force. At the time, British aircraft manufacturing was running at capacity, and the only American product of interest, the P-40 Warhawk, was in short supply.
just 102 days after an order was placed, North American Aviation had a flying prototype ready, the NA-73, and that would soon become the Mustang Mark I. It's often thought that the original version of the Mustang, which was powered by the Allison V1710, was not a good fighter, and that only the integration of the Rolls-Royce Merlin could save it. That isn't really true, because below 15,000 feet, the Allison engine Mustang flew very well. But that was the Spitfire's domain, and what the Royal Air Force really wanted was a long-range, high-altitude escort fighter, a capability that the Spitfire couldn't provide. In 1942, Rolls-Royce test pilot Ronald Harker suggested fitting the Mustang with a Merlin Mark 66. That's the same engine used on the Mark 9 Spitfire, which was the highest flying variant of the Spitfire at that time. The Allison and the Merlin had very similar power output at low level, but the Merlin could produce about 30% more power at higher altitude. It was with the integration of the Merlin, therefore, that the Mustang really came into its own. The Mustang continued, continued to serve long after the end of the Second World War, flying in the Korean War in the early 1950s, although by that time it was ill-equipped to face a competent enemy and many units took heavy losses. Other nations, though, especially smaller ones, operated the Mustang for far longer and the last in-service Mustangs weren't retired until 1984. They were operated by the Dominican Air Force. This aircraft is now painted in the colours of Warhorse, the personal aircraft flown by Colonel Don Blakesley, a very senior American colonel who flew more missions against the Luftwaffe than any other American pilot during the Second World War. He actually started out as a Spitfire pilot for the Royal Canadian Air Force before transferring to the RAF Eagle Squadrons and finally the United States Army Air Force in 1942. With the U.S. Army Air Force, he flew the P-47, becoming the commanding officer of the 4th Fighter Group, and he then pushed hard to re-equip the unit with the P-51. In March 1944, he became the first pilot to fly a P-51 over Berlin, and in June of that year, he led the first shuttle mission to Russia. Over the course of the conflict, he accumulated over 1,000 combat hours and 15 and a half kills.
Colonel Blakesley finally retired in 1965 and passed away in 2008. This paint scheme was applied in 2020 and the aircraft now flies in honour of him. That is all we shall see of the Mustang. It's not all we shall see of the Rolls-Royce Heritage flight, though, because the Spitfire display that we enjoyed a few minutes ago will be repeated as part of our sunset show at around about 20 past 7, if I remember rightly. And we've got another pairing of very historic aircraft coming up next, the Westland Wasp flying with the fairy swordfish both coming from navy wings there they are in the far distance and uh, while we wait for them to arrive we'd like to uh, just say first of all joe marshall has done an excellent joke he says it's his best joke uh, he's put it in the chat so do go and find that um i'd also like to say uh, hello and welcome to Anyone who's joined us recently, welcome to Planes TV's live coverage of the Bournemouth Air Festival. We are with you for the duration of the show, all four days. However, this is our final day of free live streaming here on YouTube. If you want to join us tomorrow, you will need to either become a channel member here on YouTube or, better still, you can join our aviation on-demand video streaming service watch.planestv.com that will give you access to tomorrow's live stream it will give you access to some of our future live streams including in two weeks time our broadcast from the Duxford Battle of Britain air show and it will also give you access to our 30 year back catalogue of programmes if you want 50% off your subscription use the offer code Bournemouth with a capital B that is Bournemouth at watch.planestv.com As I mentioned, these two aircraft coming to us from Navy Wings. They're arriving on slot all the way from Yeovilton and will depart off slot to Yeovilton. They are both aircraft that Navy Wings operate directly. And they also have a Sea Fire, a Sea Fury, although that's not flying at the moment, a badly damaged Sea Vixen, which will probably never fly again and a Seahawk, which they hope will return to the airshow circuit sometime around 2025. They have also recently announced the intention to bring an airworthy fairy gannet back to the UK in the near future, so we very much hope that comes to fruition shortly. The aircraft we focus on now are a Swordfish Mark I in the lead and a Wasp HAS-1 flying close formation on it. The formation very sensibly being conducted this way around with a helicopter at the rear. That avoids the Swordfish having to fly through the rotor downwash created by the Wasp. These uh, joint fixed-wing rotary wing formations take an awful lot of uh, theoretical planning and training before they can be safely flown. Slight 
topic drift, but the uh, joint display flown by Team Raven and the Gazelle Squadron, a total of 10 aircraft, mix of Gazelles and Vans RV8s, that took something like two years before it was ready to be demonstrated to the public. These two aircraft have been paired up together because they both operated in a very similar role, albeit at different times. Both types being developed largely as anti-submarine platforms. Very warm welcome to George Hamilton, who has joined us as our latest Planes TV channel member. Thank you very much for your support. Planes TV channel members really do uh, help encourage us to go and do these free live broadcasts from air shows around the UK and sometimes further afield. And as a special thank you, tomorrow we will be giving our YouTube channel members access to our live stream from the Bournemouth Air Festival's Sunday flying display. Otherwise, you will have to uh, subscribe to our on-demand service to access that. Running in now for a split. And that's a shot the likes of which we don't see very often. Well, it is the Wasp that we we will see first in a solo display. We tend to refer to this as a Westland aircraft. Of course, it's not really their design. They took over the project uh, when uh, Westland was given control of all British rotary military projects by the British government. The WASP is a maritime development of the Westland Scout, which was a light general purpose helicopter developed for the British Army in the late 1950s. The WASP came along a few years later, designed in response to a requirement for a new manned anti-submarine platform. to the scouts there are a few key differences the wasp has integration with different weapon systems the likes of the mark 46 torpedo mark 44 depth charge and nord s11 wire guided missile it has free castering wheels rather than skids to allow the aircraft to be maneuvered easily on the deck of a ship 
It also has a reverse pitch setting for the rotor blades, basically the helicopter version of reverse thrust, so as to stick the wasp to the pitching, rolling deck of a ship until it could be properly secured with ropes and chains. Other modifications for the naval environment, uh, the tail boom and rotor blades were foldable so as to reduce the amount of hangarage space required on small ships. And additional fuel tanks were installed in the cabin for increased range. A later modification also saw the addition of large inflatables on either side of the cabin so the helicopter would float upright if it ever had to ditch at sea. The Wasp was an effective anti-submarine platform and it was also used in the commando assault role but the British service, in British service, it was mainly used for light transport and resupply based aboard small surface vessels. It was gradually phased out and replaced by the Western Lynx. That started in the late 1970s and the final Wasps left British service in 1988. most famously served in the conflict in the Falkland Islands when one wasp from HMS Plymouth and two from HMS Endurance scored hits on the Argentine submarine Santa Fe, damaging it badly enough that it couldn't submerge. The crew were forced to abandon their submarine and surrendered in South Georgia. That was the first engagement of the British task force of the conflict. Although it was our own Royal Navy that was the main operator of the Westland Wasp, it also flew in the service of six export customers. The final Wasp operator was Malaysia. Malaysia didn't receive their first Wasps until 1988, the same year they were retired from British service, and they continued to operate them up until the year 2000. Wasp departing to our left, Swordfish approaching from the right. And our second solo display, there it is. And yesterday we got some lovely footage of this flying uh, eye level with us at times, possibly even lower than us. Hopefully more of the same again today.
The Swordfish entered service in 1936, despite being pretty much obsolete by that time, and it served not just with the Fleet Air Arm, but also with the Royal Canadian Air Force and the Royal Netherlands Navy. It was initially used in the fleet attack role, and it did indeed sink one ship and damage two others during the Battle of Taranto in 1940. In fact, the Swordfish sank a greater tonnage of Axis shipping than any other Allied aircraft during the war, and incredibly, it remained in frontline service until VE Day, having outlived some of the aircraft that were intended to replace it. Navy wings have two swordfish, only one of which is flying at the moment. In fact, this one, Mark 1 W5856, is the only flying example swordfish in the world at the moment. It's also the oldest surviving swordfish in the world, and I'm including static and preserved examples in that category. It was built in 1941 by Blackburn Aircraft, so technically it would have been known as a blackfish rather than a swordfish. to refer to it as a swordfish just because uh, if you say blackfish not many people know what you're talking about much the same thing with uh, many aircraft that uh, operate under different names when they were produced under license so we tend to say shooting star rather than silver star and uh, the Norwegian Air Force Historical Squadron's MiG-15 we call it a MiG-15 it's uh, really technically it's an SB Lim 2 but similar thing going on with this blackfish we all call it a swordfish Wings other swordfish, which is a Mark II, hasn't flown for a few years now, but I believe the intention is that it will fly again at some point in the foreseeable future. I'd love to see a two-ship swordfish display at some point. That would be quite a sight. Angus does ask, are there plans to have both swordfish fly? Yeah, I believe so. I, I understand, yeah, the intention is to return the other one to flight and presumably keep this one going as well. Now, do remember that Navy Wings is a charity. They rely on public donations to fund much of their operations, so it does depend on cash flow whether any of these projects are able to be realised. It was the case with their... Uh, Civics, and that was due for a return to flight, but the funding from public donations was not forthcoming, and that aircraft has now been grounded for the foreseeable future. They're intending to dispose themselves of it, if they haven't already. Somewhat out of the loop on Navy Wings activities, it's possible they don't even have that Civix anymore. I'm sure someone in the chat will be able to tell us. Nice wave from the back seater there.
Looks very much like it might have been a goodbye from the swordfish. Parting off slot to return to its base at Yeovilton. We await now a team that uh, actually I'm not sure I've seen them in person before. I have seen them once at a Duxford flying day. We broadcast it live on Plains TV. I just have a memory like a zip. Um, but it's certainly uh, a, a team that we haven't seen at the Bournemouth Air Festival before. They were formed only two years ago. I'm talking about the Starlings. Just about to make their Bournemouth Air Festival debut. Flying an extra NG and a CAP 232. The pilots are Tom Cassells and Mike Pickin. This brings us into uh, quite a nice little sequence. We're going to see three world-class aerobatic aircraft in quick succession. The extra NG and the CAP 232 of the Starlings followed in short order by Rich Goodwin's jet pits. I'm hoping that uh, we might be joined very shortly by a member of uh, Rich Goodwin's ground crew to talk through that display. Yes, uh, that member of ground crew has just arrived and uh, we'll be hearing from him very shortly. Let's see what Ian's got his camera on. He's found the Starlings. Excellent stuff. So, well, what are we looking at here? We have the extra NG in the lead. And that is flown by Mike Pickin. And then the Cap 232 flown by Tom Cassells flying in the number two position. And I think what's going to happen is we'll see them making their way round to our left-hand side uh, to arrive from the left and go straight into a barrel roll for the first manoeuvre of their display. not very often that we see an extra NG at air shows because it is a very new aircraft design indeed. One of the latest aircraft to be designed by Volta Extra as part of his world-famous 
Extra 300 family. That's a family of aircraft that traces its roots back to the early 1980s. It's been the dominant force in competition aerobatics globally ever since then. And this is just the latest aerobatic team to use the extra 300 family of aircraft. So many others over the years, including the Blades here in the UK, Krasakti in Malaysia, the Aerostars in the USA, the Firebirds in Poland, the Northern Lights in Canada, the Global Stars in the UK, the Hawks of Romania, the Royal Jordanian Falcons, the Marksmen from South Africa, and several others. The highest performance version of this family of aircraft, the Extra 330SC, is used by a number of national competition aerobatic teams and has won six out of the last seven World Aerobatic Championship titles. Earlier this year, Extra unveiled the successor to the single-seat 330SC, the 330SX, and deliveries of that are due to begin in 2024. This specific model, the Extra NG, is the latest twin seater in Extra's lineup. It was unveiled in 2019. It's slightly heavier. Slightly heavier than the highest performance single seaters, but it is a more comfortable cruiser, slightly larger cockpit. digital instrument panels as well rather than analog gauges and striking a balance between aerobatic performance and cross-country cruising capability without compromising too much on its maneuverability we will see it demonstrated in solo form very shortly maneuver is a great favorite of mine it's called the looping 270 The looping 270 is coming up next. expecting to see here is a looping 270 that's a loop into a 270 degree turn very finely calculated entry point to that loop so as not to bust the display line during the turn which is directed towards the spectators sets up the aircraft to depart to our centre. They'll very shortly be pulling up into the vertical for synchronised stall turns. So, 
Airspeed speed bleeding away, pivoting round their left wing tips. Very snappy stall turns indeed, and then coming back towards us for an opposition break, they'll be performing opposing Derry turns, rolling through 270 degrees very rapidly, and then splitting across each other's paths to our left and right. Pulling up to our left and right into synchronised stall turns to reposition the aircraft to come back in towards us. A very low level opposition pass looking down on it here from our viewpoint on the top of the Cumberland Hotel and the aircraft now depart off to our centre and they will be rejoining in close formation and then turning around to come back towards us to draw a heart. brief demonstration of the Cap 232's roll rate, but this is very brief. We'll be seeing more of the Cap 232 later on, because it is the extra NG that is about to start a solo display high and to our left, rolling down towards us. The extra NG has flown today by Mike Pickin. He won his first aerobatic competition at the age of 14 and went on to become the youngest person to hold the UK Civil Aviation Authority display authorization. Age 23, he became the youngest ever UK advanced aerobatic champion, and today he is the youngest unlimited level competition aerobatics pilot in Europe. I did say, did I not, that uh, despite that little bit of extra size and weight, 
aerobatic performance had not been too much compromised for the extra NG. And it's been a very impressive solo display indeed. Now coming into its final moments as uh, we start to cast our eye around for the Cap 232, which will be arriving shortly. That's a very interesting aeroplane. So the Cap 232 coming in from in front of us. It's flown today by Tom Cassells. He's been flying air shows since 1983 and began learning aerobatics in 1992. As well as flying air shows, he is a three-time British national aerobatic champion and he's also a display authorization examiner. The aircraft that we're seeing is part of Mudri's successful family of competition aerobatic aeroplanes. All of which were developed for the French Air Force's competition aerobatics unit, the Equipe de Voltige. This started with the Cap 10 in 1970, followed by the Cap 20, Cap 21, Cap 230, 231 and finally the Cap 232, which we see now. This version first flew in 1997. The Mudri Cap family has claimed four World Aerobatic Championship titles in total. The Cap 232 specifically won in 1998 and 2000. Sadly, a structural failure in 2005 led to the Equipe de Voltige being temporarily grounded and uh, they ceased using the Cap 232. They resumed flying in 2008 using the extra 330 SC. Despite that, the Cap 232 is still very much in use on the civilian circuit. It's also used by the Moroccan Air Force for their formation aerobatic team, Marche Vert. One of the things we've seen demonstrated during this display, and something the Cap 232 is especially famous for, is its extraordinary roll performance of 420 degrees per second. That's almost twice as quick as any of the previous Mudri Cap aircraft. That roll performance was achieved by replacing the wooden wing spar found in previous versions of the Cap 232, which warped and flexed during fast rolls, and instead using carbon fibre inspired by the extra 260. That also had the effect of reducing the weight of the wing by 30 kilograms meaning there was less roll inertia and therefore improving the precision of the roll starts and stops. Well, both aircraft are about to reform now and they're going to give us one final pass in a two-ship formation, expecting this to be a mirror formation. So smoke on and we say farewell and thank you to the Starlings. What a fantastic debut, such a tight display, precise formation flying and some wonderful solos from each aircraft in turn. And this has been the Starlings aerobatic team.
coming up next we have Rich Goodwin just about to start his display and uh, I'm delighted to be joined now by Colin Hales. You are uh, one of Rich's engineers or Rich's singular engineer. Is, is it a big team? It's not a particularly big team but I'd say I'm uh, one of the main players within the team. And, uh, just arriving from the right now in uh, knife edge flight as is typical. Here is the jet pits. So uh, it's becoming obvious quite quickly, just from its performance in the vertical there, that this is no standard pits. Uh, no, not standard at all. It was actually derived by the, the crowds that come to the air shows. They wanted to see something more. And just like maybe any race driver, they want more power. As soon as they have got any car, they want more power. So we've, de de we've developed an aircraft with more power. The uh, main engine, the um, Lycoming IO540, um, we've basically pushed that engine as far as we can with uh, thrust from that engine. So therefore, to gain more thrust or more power, we, we had to go to auxiliary engines and the best option was two jet engines. So you're getting 360 horsepower from the Lycoming, is that right? Um, yes, let's just, just agree at that. Okay. Really. <laughs> uh, and how much are you getting from your two Lynx turbojets? In, in a respect of horsepower, it's about 200 horsepower per engine, but really they, we should talk about thrust from the jet engines yeah. rather than horsepower. So basically the aircraft weighs about, around about 1,500 pounds. You get approximately 1,000 pounds from the piston engine, and we've got 350 pounds of thrust from both two jet engines, so a combined thrust of 1,700 pounds. And that's just slightly more than the aircraft weighs. Yeah, so a, a thrust rate thrust to weight ratio of somewhere in the region of 1.1 to 1? Correct, yes. And that theoretically means the aircraft can hover indefinitely? It can hover, um, we're not using all the power of the jet engines and indeed it can hover um, until the aircraft runs out of fuel and it uses a lot of fuel, a lot of Jet A1. Um, but then to, we were hoping that the aircraft could then accelerate and climb away but you need a lot more thrust to be able to do that. Right. And those jet engines aren't facing straight backwards, but they're cantered outwards slightly. I just love listening to the jets, honestly. Yeah, they're great, aren't they? Such a weird combination of sounds. <laughs> that aircraft should not be making that noise. <laughs> and we shouldn't be talking over it. But yes, the, the problem was that if you pointed the jets straight back, uh, the development of the aircraft has been ongoing, but now we, the best option is to, to have two jet engines pointing backwards. But of course, the problem is we have the tailplane, the elevator, which is behind where the jets are, and we were warming the tailplane up a little too much. So we have to now actually, we have to vector the thrust outside and away from the uh, tailplane of the aircraft. And speaking of the tailplane, it's not a standard tailplane either, but the control surfaces have all been uh, modified and enlarged. Exactly. I would say there's hardly any, apart from the actual tubular structure, which is a standard Pitts S2S, there's nothing standard on the aircraft at all. And what was the development process like? Because it can't have been easy anyway, but it's got to be... There's that noise again. can't be uh, easy from a from a technology and engineering standpoint but you've got the regulatory side of things to deal with as well just watching him do cartwheels he only managed two normally you can get three in there so uh, okay that's not great um, <laughs> the development was through the light aircraft association and when we originally came up with the idea they were not happy at all because no one had got experience with jet engines uh, with the light aircraft association but we said to them, well, look, this is the perfect test bed to get data. It's not the primary engine. We can give you all the test data you'd ever want on jet engines. And uh, there's a few other issues, but we've worked through them with the LAA and uh, to see the product that you see today now. So how long was the whole uh, development process? Uh, approximately four years. And unfortunately, we only got the aircraft very early in the season. Uh, and so therefore, we've created a display. Richard's created this uh, routine. 
Uh, we now know a lot more about the aircraft and could do a lot more with it, but to change the display, to change the routine mid-season is, is not possible. It's just not possible. Well, I love these really tight loops that we're seeing now, almost like a sort of cool bit manoeuvre, as it would be called in a, a thrust vectoring fighter. It is, and this is one of his manoeuvres where he now goes to high alpha, and um, this is one of the hovering manoeuvres you'll see coming up now. OK. So he'll slow down, go to high alpha to slow the aircraft down and then increase the jet engines. There's technically only three aircraft in the world, per se, aircraft that can hover, and that's the uh, Harrier jump jet. I'm sure someone's going to come and say something else. The F-35 is the second aircraft, and the third aircraft that can hover is the jet pitch you're seeing now. Can I be that one guy? Yeah, go ahead. Yak 110. <laughs> oh, yeah, OK. okay. <laughs> designed I bowed, by, I, uh, or co-designed by uh, the same person. I bow down to your superior knowledge. So how did you come to get involved in a, such a mad project as this? Um, <laughs> yes, how does one get involved? We're just going into another hover manoeuvre here. But this time, you'll see that he allows the aircraft to torque roll. So to actually stay without torque roll occurring, you actually need airflow over the elements. So he's hovering, but technically he's not hovering. He's having to do about 15 knots airspeed to uh, stop the uh, elements to stop the torque roll. But ah. if he does go into an absolute pure hover, then there's nothing to stop the, the torque of the engine turning the aircraft, as you saw then. So I assume that the, uh, the prop wash will be enough to provide some airflow over the ailerons. Are they too far out along the wing? No, but it's like a helicopter without its tail, plane, uh, without its tail rotor. It just simply can't counteract the thrust that you can obtain from, the, uh, from that very powerful engine. So this idea came about from airshow enthusiasts, but when did Rich start to take it seriously? Indeed, uh, I mean, it is driven by the air show pundits and such and the, and the people that come to see. I mean, Richard's got two bit specials now and the air show is saying, Richard, you're very good with your flick manoeuvres, which we're seeing now, but what can you bring new to the air show scene? And uh, we wanted to bring something new and un unique. And, uh, you know, this is truly a unique aircraft um, with the combination of, of uh, piston engine and jet engines. Um, no, we took it really seriously right from the word go. This has been a, a long term not dream because it's now happening but um, an intention to do this it's it's been a lot of hard work and there's still a lot of development to do with the aircraft um, you know it is such a new aircraft we just we we're looking at, at it very carefully it's it's so new we, we're monitoring it so so closely for um, its structure and its safety and security yeah. um, at the end of the season we will see where we can go and what we can do from there next year and hopefully bring better and more interesting performances So you mentioned that you've discovered over the course of uh, flying this summer some of uh, the aircraft's previously unknown capabilities. Uh, is there anything specific that you think you might be able to do with it next season? Oh, absolutely. We're not running the jets quite at full power yet. Um, and this is, I love this manoeuvre here where you can actually see the thrust of the propeller and the jets. People can spiral down, but Richard with these jet pits can spiral upwards. Oh, I love this manoeuvre. So this manoeuvre we're going to develop further and try and call it the Christmas tree because hopefully we can get tighter and tighter and tighter and then come to a halt at the top ah. where Richard then becomes the angel at the top of the Christmas tree. So we're, there's, a lot, there's lots of things planned, but again, the aircraft is so new. We're, we're learning what we can do with it every single time we fly the aircraft. Oh, I love that idea. And he's getting pretty tight now up there. And it's lovely against the blue sky like this. Actually seeing that spiral is quite surreal, getting tighter on the way up. Indeed, indeed. So you, you must be quite proud watching this. I cry every time. 
I'll get I'll get emotional now. It's been um, been hard work, really hard work. Um, lots of barriers and so on, but we've just kept pushing and pushing, and we're overjoyed with the uh, product that Richard's created. It's just astonishing. I'm really proud to be part of it. So coming towards the end of the display now, and uh, is this one of Richard's famous knife edge passes coming up? Uh, no, quite there yet. <laughs> so the display quite a few times. Um, if it is, he's changed his display, which is not unheard of. <laughs> it was a very, very brief one. I'm not going to say what Richard does because he makes it up sometimes, but um, I believe uh, there'll be another knife edge pass and then his departure is at the end of the display. So this is in, into another hovering manoeuvre. So the uh, jet fuel tanks, the 70 litres of jet A1 in the aircraft, and it will use both engines, two engines of course, they're using about 35 litres just for this 10 minute display. The six tanks on the aircraft, because obviously we need avgas for the petrol engine, uh, the, uh, the IO540 Lycoming engine, we need jet fuel obviously for the jet engines, but we also need smoke oil for the uh, smoke that's coming out of the exhaust. Yeah. So the aircraft has um, yeah, indeed six tanks, and I believe the AK has changed his, his display, and I believe that's the end of it. Yeah, I remember, well, one of his party tricks nowadays is taxiing back to his parking position just using the jets, but he said he only did that when he had enough fuel left in the jet engines, and it just goes to show uh, uh, how much he burns through over the course of a relatively short display sequence. It's an incredible amount, but also the engines now have a cool-down process, and they need to be lubricated until they've cooled down and come to a complete stop. So if we actually run them out of fuel, the oil is in the fuel, so if we run out of fuel, we run out of lubricating oil, and that can cause major problems to the engines. So he has to make sure he finishes his display still with fuel on board. Mm. Well, I've got so many more questions about <laughs> this aircraft. Well, and, another time, uh, another well, time. <laughs> maybe you can join us again tomorrow. We shall see. I'd be delighted. <laughs> Excellent. Thank well, you, Adam. Thank you very much, Colin. Good pleasure. Colin will join us again tomorrow. If you do want to join us tomorrow, then uh, we are asking for a little bit of money. I know I've mentioned this uh, several times now, but tomorrow's live broadcast. In order to view it, you will either need to be a channel member here on YouTube, or better still, uh, you can sign up to our on-demand service, watch.planestv.com. We're offering 50% off this weekend if you use the offer code Bournemouth. That's Bournemouth with a capital B at watch.planestv.com. It gives you 50% off. You can get a month for £5. And for your £5, you'll be getting our live stream from Bournemouth tomorrow with further input from Colin, I hope. But you'll also be getting our live stream from the Duxford Battle of Britain Air Show very shortly in uh, two weeks' time. Plus access to our 30-year archive of programmes going all the way back to 1989. So we're waiting now for the Red Arrows who are due at, let me just get my phone out, no I can't, it's over there. I'm leaving it all over the place. I think we're expecting the Red Arrows at 5 o'clock today and they are our next air show participants. So uh, there'll be a short gap here, we'll probably hear Red 10 taking the microphone very shortly. And uh, that will bring us to the end of uh, this block of displays, our second of three blocks of displays this afternoon. The action will resume at 1926. That is the sunset show, which will feature a Spitfire PR-19 Typhoon FGR-4. If you were with us yesterday, you'll know that that can be a little bit special. Uh, pyrotechnic displays from the Firebirds and Otto the Helicopter, and then a nighttime jump by the Tigers parachute display team. All that's still coming up after the Red Arrows. It's all going to be on this stream. We're going to keep it running, so do stick with us. We have heard bits of Red Arrows footage. Uh, sorry, bits of Red Arrows. <laughs> hearing things in my ears and getting a bit confused. We have uh, uh, heard bits of um, Red Arrow movement and we'll probably see them uh, 
on the skyline at some point fairly soon. Maybe we'll get a, a, a shot of them in the distance. But uh, until then, let's take a quick look at the action from yesterday afternoon to give you an idea what you'll see if you stick around for the evening show. Uh, here's a look at the typhoon. So, fairly magical to see the uh, reheat actually illuminating the clouds of vapour there and the aircraft just catching the setting sun as well. That, even by the standards of typhoon displays, was a fairly special one. I'll have a quick look at the chat and uh, see what everybody makes of the show so far. I hope you enjoyed Rich Goodwin. That's quite a remarkable aircraft and uh, thanks again to Colin uh, for helping talk through it. Uh, welcome to 1234, our latest Planes TV channel member. Thank you for supporting us and we hope you have enjoyed the programme and will continue to enjoy the programme tomorrow. As a reminder, our channel members here on YouTube will have access to our live broadcast from tomorrow's air show here at Bournemouth. We will not be broadcasting for free. We do need to pay for our dinner and hotel somehow, I'm afraid. Our thanks go to the Cumberland Hotel who have been hosting us on their roof and this gives us a really excellent vantage point uh, of the Red Arrows display which is due to start in just a few minutes time for the synchro pair who are allowed down to 100 feet we will be looking down at some of their manoeuvres we're not only elevated on top of the hotel but the hotel is elevated on top of a cliff so I would guess and I'm just plucking a number out of the air really but I would guess that we've probably got a couple of hundred feet elevation uh, as compared to the surface of the water here the Red Arrows are airborne. Red 10 has taken the microphone down below. Uh, if you are just joining us and you're wondering who the voice is and why Red 10 isn't talking you through this display himself, uh, hello, my name is Adam. I'm normally a camera operator with Planes TV, but uh, as we are up here on the roof of the Cumberland Hotel today, uh, it's not an option to uh, take the official air show commentary, so I'm doing my best to talk you through the action. I uh, hope you've been enjoying it so far. It's, I hope, better than watching the air show in silence. If you are uh, a Red Arrows fan, then we've got plenty more Red Arrows displays that we'll be broadcasting over the coming weeks. We'll be following them up to the Air Show Festival of Flight in Scotland next weekend, following them to Jersey. A few days after that, well, they'll be displaying alongside their French counterparts, the Patouille de France. Those will go out free on YouTube. And then, uh, in addition to that, we have the uh, Duxford Battle of Britain Air Show. That will be exclusively for uh, our watch.planestv.com subscribers. One more reminder before the Reds, we do have that 50% discount code. Use the code Bournemouth, and that will give you 50% off your first month, giving you access to Sunday's stream with the Red Arrows and the Duxford Battle of Britain Air Show stream in two, days uh, two weeks' time. So we're scanning the horizon to our south now, and... Uh, Ian has picked them up. Yes, over the top of Bournemouth Town Centre. And looking at the cloud conditions, I would say this is going to be a full show. The red, white and blue smoke about to come on as the Red Arrows arrive in wall formation and pull up for a loop. So the smoke colour changing to white as the team pull up into a loop in the first formation change of the day. Maintaining the same shape as before, but the aircraft moving substantially closer together as they change from wall formation into eight arrow. They are displaying as an eight ship team this year. That is due to limitations on the number of new pilots that can be trained. Only five returning pilots staying with the team over the winter and capacity to train just three more. So a maximum of just eight in the team this year.
some uh, wingtip vortices being pulled out of the moist sea air here at Bournemouth as the team exit that loop and head out to our left. We're about to see another formation change. And this will be into Vixen formation. We're watching Reds 7 and 8 on the extreme outside edges of the formation who are about to perform tight matched roles in line behind Reds 4 and 5. So here comes the smoke, still in 8 arrow, the team about to roll level and then we'll see those tight matched rolls and the formation change into Vixen. Red Arrows fly the Hawk T-Mark 1, an aircraft which has now been retired from its primary duties with the Royal Air Force. It did serve in the advanced jet training role. That has been taken over by the Hawk T-Mark 2. It also served in the aggressor role, but it has been retired from that as well, meaning that the Red Arrows is the only unit that is left operating the Hawk T-1. Although they uh, are also used for aeromedical research flights. team now repositioning out to our right. They're still in Vixen formation and this will be for the first barrel roll of the show. Although the Hawk has been largely retired from its duties with the Royal Air Force, it, or rather the Hawk T1 has been largely retired, I should say, it remains a, a hugely successful aircraft. It's not the most produced advanced jet trainer in history, but it is arguably the best-selling advanced jet trainer ever built in terms of export orders. It has been operated by countries as diverse as Canada, Kuwait, Malaysia, the United States, Switzerland, South Africa, and the Republic of Korea, among several others. It is also used today by four national aerobatic teams. The Red Arrows, Surya Kiran from India, the Saudi Hawks, and if you subscribe to watch.planestv.com, you can see them in action at the Royal International Air Tattoo 2023, and also Finland's Midnight Hawks, Again, we've covered them at the Royal International Air Tattoo. That was in 2017, and you can see that film if you have subscribed to watch.planestv.com. Now, this year's Red Arrows display is uh, partially themed around the uh, relatively newly formed UK Space Command, and we're seeing a few space-themed shapes uh, over the next couple of manoeuvres. This is the first of them. It is called Apollo Formation, inspired by the lunar landing craft. formation change to another of those space themed shapes the team continuing around to our front and changing into eagle formation completing this 360 degree turn and they'll very shortly come back towards us for what the red arrows call a present a belly up pass giving us a good view of the formation shape and this, again, inspired by the Apollo missions and specifically the Eagle landing craft. Now 
in many ways it is a great advantage that the Red Arrows and indeed most European aerobatic teams use training aircraft rather than fighters, not just on grounds of cost, uh, but also in terms of how well suited they are to flying in this environment. Their best manoeuvring speed is subsonic, the sort of 300, 400 knot range in which we see them flying at air shows. They're able to therefore fly much tighter to the crowd. And of course, they don't have after-burning engines, which makes the integration of coloured smoke much easier. It's not impossible for teams with aircraft that have reheated engines to use coloured smoke, uh, but it is an extra complexity, and certainly the likes of the Thunderbirds have experimented with it over the years and decided that it's not really practical for them. Here come the team again from the right-hand side. This time, they're in lightning formation, depicting the F-35 in for another barrel roll. smoke system consists of a smoke pod on the underside of the fuselage which is topped up before every flight. There's three tanks within the smoke pod, one for white smoke with five minutes of smoke oil capacity and then one each for red and blue smoke. One minute of capacity for each of the colours. The white smoke is simply diesel, the coloured smoke is diesel with added dye. It's interesting that uh, the reds are relatively unusual in that uh, each aircraft has all three colours available. Uh, many other teams, like the Patrie de France, just have white smoke uh, and then one of the two colours. And the, the even-numbered aircraft have red and the odd-numbered have blue or perhaps the other way around. Uh, and uh, the display just has to be choreographed to make sure that uh, the colours remain symmetrical throughout. The reds have that extra flexibility of each aircraft being able to produce all three colours. The smoke pod itself is installed on the centerline hardpoint on the underside of the fuselage and is controlled by three colour control buttons on the aircraft's control column. So we have a real crowd favourite manoeuvre coming up next as the aircraft reposition out to our right-hand side. I'm sure many of you who are watching this display know exactly what's coming up. You'll have all seen the Red Arrows plenty enough times. The aircraft splitting apart slightly. Red 7 and 8 following in a loose trail formation. 1 to 6 in a tight delta formation. They're about to roll out towards us. And then as the wings roll level, red 7 and 8 will start to barrel roll around the rest of the formation. This is Tornado. It's tricky enough for red 7 and 8 with the formation flying in a straight line, but Red 1 is about to make it considerably harder for them by entering a 90-degree right-hand turn, and the coloured smoke is about to come on. coming towards the end of the first half of the Red Arrows display and during this short break in proceedings while the aircraft reposition out in front of the crowd I just want to say hello and welcome to everyone who's joining us here on Plains TV welcome to the broadcast uh, live from the Bournemouth Air Festival putting it out free on YouTube today here all four days though first three days going out free on YouTube and tomorrow you will need to be a channel member or a subscriber to our on-demand service in order to watch the stream
coming now towards the start of the second half of the show. We're about to break the team down into smaller groups. Initially, we'll see the team rolling out towards us. Five aircraft on the top in leader's benefit formation. They are going to split. And then three more aircraft at the bottom. We'll put the coloured smoke on. For a manoeuvre called the detonator. So those aircraft at the top of the formation, Reds 1 to 5, they are known as Enid, named after Enid Blyton's famous five. They break now, and then at the bottom we have Hannah, named after Ray Hannah, former leader of the Red Arrows, and now it's their turn to split. So we keep our eyes on red six and seven, the synchro pair, who are pulling up into derry turns to our left and right. This will enable them to reposition and head back towards us for the first of their opposition passes. All these passes, they are cleared down to just 100 feet. So far, we've seen the reds flying no lower than 300 feet, but the synchro pair allowed to fly considerably lower than the rest of the formation. And they will be performing four-point hesitation rolls. And we keep our eyes on the synchro pair out to our left and right, who will be turning back towards us for another opposition pass this time rolling out with their nose lights heading almost straight towards us isn't that a great shot now and then breaking away to cross in the cyclone As the synchro pair depart to our front, Red 8 is approaching from the right-hand side with blue smoke on. Meanwhile, out on our left 45, here comes Enid. Enid forming an inverted V-shape, Red 8 about to fly through the middle of it in the goose. Reds 1 to 5 depart to our right hand side. You can see at the back of the aircraft the air brake extended. That introduces extra drag, means the aircraft need to use a higher power setting in order to maintain speed. That in turn means a hotter exhaust, the smoke burning brighter. It also disturbs the airflow. Thus, that makes the smoke trail below more thickly. Meanwhile, out to our front. We have the synchro pair pulling up in line astern formation. The smoke about to come on as this is going to be one of their classic manoeuvres, the heart. If you look top left corner of the heart, Red 8 about to draw a spear through the middle of it. He just climbed to altitude following the goose, setting up to draw that spear. Perfectly positioned and timed. Meanwhile, Reds 6 and 7 complete the heart of the bottom. They head out to our left and right and then commence turns back towards us. They're going to descend to just 100 feet above the water and then perform synchronised barrel rolls before crossing once again. This manoeuvre is called the double rolls.
now at right 45. Reds 1 to 5 have joined up with Red 8, who has just finished spearing the heart, if you remember. And they have created a six ship leader's benefit formation. They're doing a pair of barrel rolls, one on the right 45 degree line towards us, the other on the left 45 degree line away from us. Coloured smoke initially, about to change to white smoke as they draw a snake-like ribbon of smoke in the sky more than five miles long. This is Python. view there of just why the barrel roll is called the barrel roll. You can see them transcribing the shape of the inside of a barrel as they complete the python. And then we look to the left and right for the return of the synchro pair. They will have their white smoke on and they'll be performing what is the only looping maneuver that actually features in the rolling show flying in towards us, crossing and then pulling up into half Cubans to return back towards show center and cross once again. This maneuver is called the boomerang. So there they go, pulling up with white smoke into two thirds of a loop and then a half roll on the down line before pulling back into level flight. to our left 45 over the needles. We have Reds 1 to 5, about to pull up into, I would say, my favourite manoeuvre of the 2023 Red Arrows display sequence. They're first going to execute a quarter clover, that's a loop with a 90 degree rolling component. So there they go into the loop, starting to twist it now through 90 degrees. This manoeuvre featuring in the display for the first time since 2019. The red arrows coming over the top. The coloured smoke about to come on and get ready for the good bit. This is the vertical break. We look next to our right-hand side for the return of Hannah. Red 6, 7 and 8. Red 6 is going to roll inverted. 7 and 8 are going to be barrel rolling around his smoke trail. This is called the corkscrew. Well, Enid formation have a very difficult uh, sequence of flying at the moment because you might recall they just broke apart as part of the uh, vertical break and now they have to reform in very short order off to our right-hand side. In fact, they're still finishing getting into formation now. Red 5 has just slotted in and this will be for their most challenging individual manoeuvre of the display. Reds, three and four, Reds 2 and 3, sorry, about to pitch up and perform tight match rolls to the outside of the formation. There they go. Reds four and five about to follow suit in the rollbacks.
So as Enid complete their rollbacks to the left. Enid, sorry, Hannah is approaching from the front. So one of their most photogenic manoeuvres of the display. Hannah has been renamed for the 2023 season. They were previously known as Jippo in honour of the first pilot to lead this back group of aircraft. Now known as Hannah, a former Red Arrows leader, the longest serving Red Arrows leader in fact. It was under his leadership that the Red Arrows expanded to a nine ship team. He's now perhaps equally famous for his exploits in the uh, civilian air show world flying warbirds. So here come Hannah now from the front about to split in the Hannah break. coming towards the end of the Red Arrows display, but we keep our eye on the synchro pair, Red 6 and 7, out to our left and right. They are about to come in for their final manoeuvre. Down to 100 feet above the sea, they'll be performing barrel rolls as they fly towards each other, and then as they cross, both aircraft rolling inverted in a manoeuvre known as the crossbow. To our front. Reds 1 to 5 are about to perform the final maneuver of the Red Arrows display here at Bournemouth today. Red 1 pitching up with a red smoke on, performing barrel rolls in alternating directions round the rest of his teammates, drawing the infinity symbol in the sky. This is the infinity break. You've been watching the Red Arrows on Planes TV's live coverage of the Bournemouth Air Festival 2023. hope you enjoyed that as much as we did. Still a little bit of noise going on as the Red Arrows uh, rejoin out in front of us. They'll now be returning to Bournemouth Airport, which is where they're based. Uh, we might be able to catch their landing break. Uh, we'll try and bring it to you if we can. But that is uh, the end of the Red Arrows display. It's not the end of today's flying action because we do have a whole uh, extra block of flying still to come. That is going to start at 1926. Uh, it includes the Spitfire PR-19 of the Rolls-Royce Heritage Flight, uh, Anarchy 1, the Typhoon FGR-4, returning for its second display of the day, uh, the Firebirds aerobatic team. Similar display to what we saw earlier, but with added fireworks. They really are painting with light. Otto the helicopter. I mean, who doesn't love a helicopter spurting out 2,500 pyrotechnic effects over the course of about four minutes? Uh, and then closing the show uh, at 2022, we have the Tigers parachute display team. So, still an awful lot to look forward to. We're going to keep this stream running. Do stay with us. Uh, also, well, uh, we're, we're just uh, chatting among ourselves, and we think the uh, cloud conditions behind us look sufficient that the Red Arrows might fly their fairly rarely seen spaghetti break as they arrive at Bournemouth Airport. So we're going to try and bring that to you. Uh, it's quite a spectacular sight. It will be in the distance. The airport is a good five plus miles away, but uh, yeah, we will try and get a camera on that because I'd say the conditions are looking quite good for a spaghetti break. It's a rather spectacular way of getting the aircraft equally spaced out into the landing pattern. So like I said, the action far from over. Uh, and if you've enjoyed the Red Arrows today and you want to see more of them, then we are back at Bournemouth tomorrow. We've got a uh, very similar flying lineup to what uh, we saw today, although I'm hoping that the de Havilland Vampire will be able to join us uh, for tomorrow's flying programme. It was scheduled today, but uh, didn't participate uh, when push came to shove. Not sure why. If you want to join us for tomorrow's live stream, 
Uh, then there's two ways you can do that. You can become a channel member here on YouTube, or you can subscribe to our streaming service, watch.planestv.com. Uh, that really is the ultimate. It gives you access to our live broadcast from Bournemouth here tomorrow, our upcoming live broadcast from the Duxford Battle of Britain Air Show. That will be exclusively available on watch.planestv.com. Uh, plus, perhaps most importantly, our 30-year archive of air show programmes dating back to 1989, uh, live streams from Riyadh's gone by, uh, whole load of planes literally hundreds of planes tv dvds have been digitized and and put on that program and planes tv vhs's as well there's a, a huge amount of entertainment there something like 300 hours uh, of air show entertainment uh, we are offering 50 percent off if you head to watch.planestv.com and use the offer code bournemouth that's bournemouth with a capital b and that will give you 50 percent off your first month or if you take out our annual plan 50 uh, percent off your first year so that really is an uh, amazing offer. £50 for a full year subscription to uh, watch.planestv.com. That's the price of two of our DVDs. It's a no-brainer, I think. Uh, if you can't quite stretch to that, then the next best thing is to uh, join us as a YouTube channel member. That's a great way of supporting us uh, in doing some of these free streams, encouraging us to get out uh, to shows like this and broadcasting them uh, at no cost. Uh, we have decided, just as a special treat, to give our generous uh, channel members access to that live stream tomorrow. Uh, so, uh, yep, yeah, that's, uh, that's a, a relatively low-cost way of supporting us and getting access to the stream. I think I'm sort of running out of things to say now, um, apart from that, uh, well, please do stick with us because the action will continue. Um, Colin, I think, is waving goodbye, who talked us through Rich Goodwin's display earlier. Goodbye, see you tomorrow, I hope. Excellent. Well, I would so much appreciate Colin coming and talking us through Rich Goodwin's display it's not an easy display to try and commentate on if you don't know the routine. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and lots of technical knowledge about the aircraft as well. Colin is, uh, has been one of the leading lights in developing that jet-powered Pitts aeroplane and very grateful for him joining us. Bill Wilson, the guy on screen should get out in the sun more. I know I'm very pale, but honestly, I do this every single weekend. <laughs> I'm always at air shows in the sun. I do try. Uh, good reaction to the red arrows in the chat. Glad you all enjoyed that as much as we did. Biggles Tintin, it might be a bit too hazy to see the break, he says. Well, uh... We have seen other aircraft operating from Bournemouth Airport today. We saw the Lancaster uh, landing back on after its display, and we have seen uh, at points the Red Arrow scudding around on the uh, or above the Bournemouth skyline behind us. So um, crossing our fingers, and we will bring that to you if we can. Stick with us, because it shouldn't be more than five minutes away. Uh, Trainsfan21 asks if we're going to Southport on the 9th and 10th of September. No, we're not. That is because on that weekend uh, we are broadcasting the Air Festival of Flight up in Scotland. That will be going out free on YouTube. We're very much looking forward to attending that event, which is returning for the first time. Uh, it was previously uh, the Scottish International Air Show, I think, was last held in about 2017, 2018, and, uh, and then it disappeared from the calendar. It's now under new ownership, being run by the local council, uh, rebranded to the Air Show Festival of Flight. Lovely to see that returning to the Air Show calendar. And we will be bringing you that live. Make sure you are subscribed to our YouTube channel. Press the bell to get notified when we do go live from air. And then following that, just a few days later, we are at the Jersey International Air Display. Red Arrows and Patouille de France headlining that event. Then the Duxford Battle of Britain Air Show exclusively on watch.planestv.com. We are looking forward to seeing a sky full of Spitfires and Hurricanes, 12 Spitfires and 4 Hurricanes, with possibly more still to be added, all flying in a big wing formation. That's going to be quite special. B-17 flying with the Lancaster, possibly even more special. And more Red Arrows action, because who doesn't love that? And clearly my sales pitch has gone down fairly well because One Eye Dave has joined us as our latest Planes TV channel member. Thank you very much. We do appreciate it. It does help make all of this much more viable. 
So Ian predicts the red arrows are shortly going to come within range of his camera as they return to Bournemouth Airport. And let's cross our fingers for that spaghetti break. <laughs> Joe Marshall says he's going to try and get our autograph uh, when we go to air next weekend. Well, you'd be welcome to it. I'm not sure why you'd want one. Here go the Red Arrows, pulling up for the spaghetti break. Changing from eight arrow into Vixen formation there as they go up over the top of the loop and watch for them to split on the down line. Splitting at equal angles so as to manoeuvre themselves into the landing pattern with safe and predictable spacing between each aircraft. Sadly, not a manoeuvre they're allowed to perform when, there are, uh, when they're performing at uh, airfield-based air shows because it necessitates flying over the crowd. They do head away from the airport in every single direction. Oh, there we go. A little bit of extra Red Arrows action with a nice spaghetti break. Lima M Flight Simulator asks uh, about the Red Arrows flying as an eight ship rather than the usual nine. Yes, uh, that has been the case uh, for the entirety of this season. They flew as a seven ship uh, last year. Uh, then due to training limitations, the largest they could get next year, uh, the largest they could get this year was an eight ship. They are anticipating being back to a nine ship next year. Next year is going to be a very busy season for them because it is their 60th anniversary year. And there are big plans afoot for the Red Arrows 2023 display season. Alexander Cusden asks, will your older DVDs ever be converted to digital format? I'd like to get old Shoreham vids, but I don't have a DVD player. Well, I think, um, yes, uh, many of us are in that position. I don't have a DVD player. Um, many of those old DVDs are already digitized and available on the watch.planestv.com service. We've got somewhere in the region of 300 hours of uh, aviation entertainment already on there. I don't know about the Shoreham videos specifically. I do know that uh, a lot of the British Airshow films are available on watch.planestv.com and many of those will include Shoreham segments. Um, as for the full Shoreham films, I can make a request to Ian that he moves them up the priority queue. We are slowly in the process of digitising everything. Uh, I know one of the things that's next on his list, because Adrian promised it earlier today uh, when someone inquired about it, Air Shows 99, which is a fantastic DVD that I own and can no longer play. And th that uh, features air shows right across Europe and North America, uh, recorded in the year 1999. A fair amount of stuff that we don't see anymore. It's very nicely filmed. Adrian says it's one of the programmes that he's proudest of, uh, even after something like 34 years in the business. So, uh, yeah, we're slowly working through that back catalogue of programmes. Ambulance helicopter making its way along the show line. Uh, Trains fan 21 asks a follow-up question, uh, well, a follow-up statement really that he's uh, he was asking about Southport because he wants to see Red Arrows, Blackjack, and Battle of Britain Memorial flight action. Uh, well, as I said, we are at the uh, Air Show Festival of Flight in Scotland that weekend, but that event will include the Red Arrows, and I think I'm right in saying the Typhoon and Battle of Britain Memorial flight as well. So stick with us; it's going out free on YouTube. Uh, and you will uh, get to see all of your favourite display teams as part of that event. We'll then be following the Reds to Jersey, so 
That show will go out live free on YouTube and feature even more Red Arrows action. And then at watch.planestv.com, we've got the Duxford Battle of Britain air show. Yet more Red Arrows action. You will need to be a paying subscriber, but now is the time to uh, place that subscription because we have that 50% off deal. Head to watch.planestv.com, use the code Bournemouth, capital B, and you will get access to tomorrow's stream and the Duxford Battle of Britain air show stream for your £5. Plus, of course, all of the free stuff that goes out on YouTube as well from Jersey and Air. Welcome to Dizzy Grenade, who is a new Plains TV channel supporter. It's great to see quite a number of you joining the channel over the last few days. We do really appreciate it. Lewis2400 says, has flying stock till evening? Yes, it has. And the flying due to resume in a little under two hours. 1920, we have the Spitfire kicking off the evening block of air displays, the Spitfire PR-19 for the Rolls-Royce Heritage flight. Having said that, we'll be leaving the stream running, so do, uh, do leave us um, playing in the background. And 20 minutes or so before the start of that evening display, Ian and I will hop on camera and say hello to everyone and uh, talk a little bit about what's coming up. And we're also going to try and go through some uh, replays, Andrew tells me. So if there's anything you missed today, of course, you can go back and watch the, uh, the full replay of the stream. But we'll try and get you sort of a, a choice selection of highlights in a few minutes' time. Biggles Tintin says he wouldn't be surprised to see the Thunderbirds with the Reds at React next year. I'm afraid I would because the Thunderbirds 2024 schedule has already been provisionally released and uh, React is not on it. And Monty wants to see the Blue Angels over here. Well, don't we all? But it's uh, not been since 2006 since the Blue Angels visited Europe, and that was just a one weekend trip to Leeuwarden in the Netherlands. If you want an extensive European tour from the Blue Angels, you've got to go all the way back to the 1990s. You don't go abroad very often. So I think what we'll do now is it's uh, 17.38 local time, just under two hours until the flying resumes, is I'll probably say goodbye to you all for now and uh, we'll go and track down something that we can eat for dinner. We'll see you again in an hour and a half or so uh, with a bit of a chat before the start of the evening programme. Do please stay with us because we have the Typhoon Night display, we've got a Spitfire at sunset, we've got the pyro shows, it's going to be great. And uh, if you want to join us again tomorrow, you know what to do. Uh, subscribe to watch.planestv.com for the ultimate experience. If you can't do that, uh, join us as a channel member. We'll see you again in about an hour and a half, and enjoy your evening.
everyone for sticking around during this uh, two-hour break between the main flying display and the wonderful uh, twilight uh, flying display this evening. And it is heading towards a beautiful twilight as well. I can see the sun sort of glaring me in the face. Yes. But it's, it's going to make for some very picturesque scenes as we welcome back yep. the Spitfire initially, yep. and Typhoon, and then we're into, into the Pyro Otto. shows after that, the Firebirds, Otto the Helicopter and the Tigers Parachute Display Team. Who were a bit of a challenge last night, you know, in the darkness there with the, the caravan, you sort of relying on the nav lights to, oh, to I watched it up. back, we did all right. Did all right, it was passable, yeah. Um, I hope you're excited about this, it's going to be pretty special. Around about eight minutes to go before the flying resumes, as I say, with the Spitfire in some gorgeous light mm. it's going to be quite special so do stick around and um, thank you for um bearing with us the last three days not bearing with us for uh, I, I say bearing with us because these are long broadcasts and i'm very conscious that people have been watching throughout especially those of you who are watching throughout on thursday which is appalling weather uh, you wouldn't believe it's the same country uh, looking at the conditions today um and thank you also to cumberland hotel providing us with this excellent uh, platform vantage point to enjoy the displays from Bournemouth offers a fa fabulous uh, clifftop vantage point to yeah. watch the displays for spectators and we've got just that extra. Yeah, what, we're on an elevated feet? vantage point on an elevated vantage point, yeah. looking down on some of the displays. Including Typhoon today, that was really quite special and we'll, I'm hoping for a few more of those shots uh, during its display today. So a big thank you to the Cumberland Hotel, it's wonderful hospitality downstairs. Yeah. We can hear the live music, everybody's down by the pool having a meal, having a good time. What a place that is going to be to enjoy the Typhoon and Spitfire dust displays from. Absolutely, and uh, one for you to consider in future years. And I think, I think Adrian's right. If you do decide to come and uh, stay at the Cumberland and for, uh, for um, at the Air Festival in future years, do mention Planes TV so they know you, that you heard about it through us. And um, yeah, big thank you to the Cumberland. And also Airfix have supported us. Uh, We've got some good shadows being created by my father's hair at the moment. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Nice little bit of shade there. Thank you, Adrian. He's a liability on set, I'll tell you that, man. No. <laughs> Always good to have Adrian around. He's uh, uh, been chatting with Airfix, and uh, he would have spoken to you earlier about his days building Airfix kits. And they've been very supportive of our live broadcasts. Um, they are in the town uh, over Air Festival weekend, and you can go along and make a free Airfix kit, I believe. Yeah, yeah it's a Red um, Arrows Hawk. Yeah, so um, there's a little video here explaining where exactly they are and what you can do. Hi everyone, my name's James. I'm here at Bournemouth Air Festival with Airfix. Please come down and say hello. We're currently building three Red Arrow Hawks, also with all the glue, paint and everything included. Um, so if you're watching, please come down, please say hello and enjoy the Air Festival. We've been building these three Red Arrows from Airfix and you can paint them and you can glue them together like this one that's nearly complete. Just have this little part here to put that on, on the wing. Don't you? We do indeed. And we're also here with our shop, and some of our best deals here are uh, quick builds, which are two for twenty-five pounds. And over there, we have our starter sets at ten pounds each. Find Airfix at Bournemouth this weekend. We're currently outside the old Debenhams building over here. for our live broadcast over the years it really does help uh, encourage us to get out and about and as does all of your support as well your likes new subscriptions and channel memberships yeah we saw Ian N uh, joining the channel as a member uh, over the two-hour break that we've just had and that's particularly important on this of all weekends because it is uh, only channel members and subscribers to our on-demand service watch.planestv.com who will be able to join us from Bournemouth tomorrow I'm afraid after three days of free streaming <laughs> we have decided that uh, you're gonna have to contribute a little something to join us on Sunday we're hoping it will be worthwhile and you've got the choice there so the channel memberships it's quite it's it's an easier viewing experience on YouTube, I must admit. So £5 membership uh, does get you access to our broadcast tomorrow. And the, the little perk of having uh, your name in bold and a nice logo next to your name in the chat if you join it. Um, the benefit of the PTV On Demand service is it does give you access to our back catalogue as well. So that stretches back 34 years. Adrian, who was uh, casting shadows over me a moment ago, created much of that, um, that uh, service. Yeah, at watch.planestv.com and we've enabled a coupon code available this weekend only. Use the coupon code Bournemouth with a capital B and you'll get half price off your first month or year 
um, so that makes a, your first month just five pounds rather than ten. Yeah. So yeah, both offerings there are available to you uh, to, if you fancy joining the action tomorrow. And we're yeah. expecting much of the same. Much of the same, uh, but hopefully the vampire joining us again tomorrow. I'm not sure why that dropped off the list today. Worth noting as well that uh, if you do join up for a month now, included in that month subscription uh, is the Duxford Battle of Britain air show, which is being streamed exclusively on watch.planestv.com in two weeks' time. A sky full of Spitfires and Hurricanes, 12 Spitfires and four Hurricanes on the list as of now, but also a formation of Lancaster and B-17, a huge number of other warbirds, and two more days of Red Arrows. I mean, go one better and come to Duxford, of course, but if you can't make it, about that available to you if you sign up now to watch.planestv.com. So we're gearing up. I'm hoping the band might pipe down by the time that we see the Spitfire in the air. We had the uh, juxtaposition of the sort of Latin American band and the Battle of Britain Memorial flight the other day. Yes. In, in defence of the band, the BBMF had been shifted to yeah. that latter part of the programme yeah. as opposed to kicking things off due to weather conditions, yeah. presumably. Um, yeah, so hopefully they'll pipe down in a little while. But uh, Adam will be taking you through the displays, the Rolls Royce Heritage Flight the Spitfire. Yeah, things off. I'm going to try and talk a little bit less for these evening shows so you can enjoy some of the atmosphere of being here. And uh, we've lined up a little bit of music as well. So hopefully rather more atmospheric than the day shows. We went from an informational day show to an atmospheric night show. That's, that's my plan anyway. But I'll be introducing the acts and uh, giving you a little information about them. Yeah, certainly in a nice atmosphere as well. The wind has dropped significantly. The flag's still fluttering away, but uh, only very gently. And the sun lowering in the sky. There is a little cloud lower down, so we don't have much of a window now for this sort of golden hour of light, which we can see over the... Uh, gosh, it does look very picturesque out mm. there. But I, uh, I'm, not, I'm less optimistic than I was yesterday, actually, now for uh, nice light on some of the displays. There is low cloud above the horizon. I reckon if we get some flying in in the next five minutes, we'll be golden in both senses of the word. Very but nice. uh, Enjoy the pun. It's a decent pun, isn't it? It's one of my best today. Um, but uh, uh, much later than that, we might just lose that light a little bit. But, but hey, that makes it darker. It means the Typhoon's reheat stands out even better. It does. Bit of jeopardy for you. And Michael mentioning in the chat that the uh, Tigers are off the running order on the app, so maybe not seeing the Tigers tonight. I'm going to hop up on camera because we've only got a minute and a half to go till uh, flying. Yeah. It's minute, minute, two, minute two six is, is what we're expecting to see. So we'll grab, Adrian can put his Pepsi down. I can hop up on the stand stage there and get on the camera and I'll leave you in the hands of Adam to take you through these displays. Thank you very much for joining us. You can carry on chatting if you like, Adam. Yeah, so one minute away from the start of this Spitfire display from the Rolls-Royce Heritage the flight. Muted. This uh, Spitfire will be flown for us today by Alistair Williams. We've already seen it participating in the daytime portion of our flying display program. It does seem like today we've got not one music track, but two <laughs> accompanying the Spitfire display. Fortunately, there's uh, simply nothing we can do about that, but uh, yeah, sound being radiated from two sound systems directly in front of us. I uh, hope you can still appreciate some of the sound of a Rolls-Royce Gryphon engine during this display.
The aircraft are watching a Spitfire PR-19 optimised for photo reconnaissance and meteorological research. It's an aircraft that perhaps in a way should never have been built. It was an order for Supermarine Spitefuls that ended up being cancelled. And 74 PR-19 Spitfires were delivered as a stopgap instead. After a short military career flying over occupied Europe, this aircraft went on to become a meteorological research platform. It was then a founding member of the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight. Well, what a lovely display that was, and I hope that you were able to enjoy some of the sounds of it. Multiple competing sound systems here, unfortunately. But here comes the Spitfire for a final pass, and this will, of course, be a victory roll. A lovely display by Alistair Williams in the Rolls-Royce Heritage Flight Spitfire PR-19. So amid that competing melee of sound, live band recorded music, Rolls-Royce Griffin, there was a fourth sound to take note of. 
which was the distant roar of the RAF Typhoon FGR4 taking off from Bournemouth Airport. It is now in the air and we will be holding out to our east. And as soon as we see that uh, strobe on the spine of the aircraft flashing away in the distance, we will get a camera on it for you. Anyone who was with us yesterday will know just how special this evening typhoon display can be. Flown in spectacular style by Flight Lieutenant Matt Brighty, this year's RAF Typhoon display pilot. He has designed an exceptional display routine, 28 pre-approved manoeuvres that he is able to choose from, along with all other new display pilots on the Typhoon, and they... Well, uh, in Bryce's case, uh, went through YouTube looking at previous Typhoon displays and deciding what bits he liked. And he's come up with a sequence that has a fair few manoeuvres in that we haven't seen from RAF fast jet displays in recent years. Also a few old favourites as well. Let's talk a little bit about the history of the Typhoon in RAF service. It entered service in 2003, took over QRA duties in 2007, and made its combat debut in 2011 as part of Operation LME, enforcing the no-fly zone over Libya. The fleet is shortly to undergo substantial changes with the retirement of the very oldest Typhoons, such as the Tranche 1 aircraft that we are seeing today, and the upgrade of those that remain with... BAE Systems and Leonardo's European Common Radar System Mark II, which is one of the most advanced active electronically scanned array radars in the world. That will give the Typhoon new and highly potent air-to-ground capabilities, as well as introducing electronic surveillance and electronic attack capability, allowing Typhoon pilots to find and degrade enemy radar. Another upgrade package known as P3EC is due in 2025. That will replace the multifunction displays in the cockpit with F-35 style large area displays, improving the pilot's situational awareness. This series of upgrades, it is hoped, will make the Typhoon a suitable contender to even take on some of the roles currently assigned to aircraft like the F-35. It is also hoped that they could open the door for further export orders. The Typhoon we're about to see, as I mentioned, is a Tranche 1 aeroplane. And they are exclusively air defence fighters. They can be armed with short and medium range air to air missiles, but this particular aircraft does not have uh, any particular ground attack or reconnaissance capabilities, even though it is designated an FGR-4. You can just about see it in the shot there. I see Ian's tracking it very nicely in the distance uh, over the headland, the Isle of Wight behind that. So uh, we are just a few minutes out from the start of the Typhoon display. Slot time, 19.39. That's three minutes from now. And if you are watching the clock and looking at the schedule and wondering why things don't quite line up, well, there is a very small delay between uh, what we're filming here and what you were seeing on the internet. And that is uh, largely just the uh, uh, practical limitations of beaming all of this footage over the internet to you. It's coming to you via space, so, you know, cut it some slack. Gillian Russell saying, we heard the Spitfire much better than yesterday. Don't know what you did, but it worked. Well, I'm very glad to hear that. Um, I can't hear what you were hearing, but Gillian, uh, I'm so pleased to hear that the sound of that Griffin engine was coming over loud and clear.
Andrew tells me that they've placed the uh, mics slightly differently today such that they pick up a little bit less of the sound down below. Uh, we didn't know yesterday when we set everything up that that was necessarily going to be a problem. Um, but today, with that prior experience, yeah, I'm able to adjust the setup ever so slightly. So I'm glad that seems to have worked. Michael Aviation talking about nine ship displays by typhoons and uh, how uh, incredible that would be. Well, Andrew's just pointing out in my ear, we have had big formations of typhoons flying past before. But we did have a four ship typhoon display at a Riat some time ago. Anyway, here we go with a solo, the Typhoon FGR4. Two impressive loaded rolls and the light from the reheat on those two EJ200 engines producing 40,000 pounds of thrust standing out well against the dark sky as the aircraft accelerates to Mach 0.95 for a fast pass and then a right hand climbing brake. here the first of the really interesting new maneuvers that Brighty has introduced for this year's display sequence a negative G on crowd bunt followed by an aileron roll demonstrating the typhoon's 250 degree per second rate of roll might just be able to hear the sound of car alarms going off in the distance as the typhoon completes the half Cuban out on the B axis and now returns towards us one and a half rolls to erect and then departs with a high G turn to our right just seen the typhoon rolling very rapidly well now it's time for a slow roll and let's see how long this roll takes I make that as about 14 seconds
achieving a roll rate of 25 degrees per second and quite some piloting skill required to pull that off while maintaining level altitude because, of course, when the aircraft is in the knife edge portions, the wings are not producing any useful lift. Well, they're certainly doing a lot of work to produce lift now at very low speed, and in fact, the effectiveness of the wings being increased uh, by the rather substantial angle of attack we're seeing demonstrated in this slow pass. The Typhoon limited by its flight control software to 24 degrees angle of attack. And completing a very menacing slow pass straight towards us and then going to kick in the reheat and demonstrates that 40,000 pounds of thrust by pulling into a loop. Those mighty engines, those extraordinary afterburner flames are being used not only to control the speed of the aircraft, but also part of the visual effects of the show. And we're going to see some very effective use of that afterburner now. Engaged as the aircraft turns its thrust buckets towards us in a 360 degree turn. And the reheat flicks out around the back of the turn in order to control the aircraft's speed and turn radius. But before the thrust buckets become visible again, that afterburner will flick back on with a puff of smoke. There it is. And now another of Bright's extraordinary new manoeuvres, a half Cuban with a knife edge recovery, showing off the top surface of this blackjack paint scheme. Now rolling back to erect to pull back into level flight. And a tall loaded barrel roll as the aircraft accelerates away to our right. This is one of the final airshow appearances for Blackjack. The aircraft is due to retire before the 2024 display season as it is coming towards the end of its fatigue life. I wonder what special scheme, if any, we'll get next year. Reverse half Cuban as the aircraft extends away from us on the B axis and comes back towards us now for what's called a derry turn. That's three quarters of an aileron roll and then pulling off to our left. A manoeuvre named after the test pilot John Derry who popularised its use at air shows in the late 1940s. And now we get ready to say goodbye to Flight Lieutenant Matt Brighty. This is his final pass. Ladies and gentlemen, the Typhoon FGR-4. was a rather more abrupt disappearance than I think any of us were expecting. <laughs> Straight into cloud at the top of that climb. <laughs> I want to see that uh, disappearance into cloud in slow motion. 
there would have been some good stuff there, says Adrian, who's manning one of the cameras. I'm, uh, I'm sure there was. Well, I have seen mentioned by Michael on the chat that uh, we're not going to be seeing a display uh, by the Tigers today, at least not according to the Bournemouth Air Festival app. Uh, but we do still have two pyro displays on the schedule for this evening. And uh, shout out to uh, Elizabeth, uh, who's enjoying the coverage and uh, says she very much enjoyed my commentary on the typhoon. So uh, thank you very much. So uh, change of pace next as we go from something loud, something dramatic, to something extremely graceful. We are going to be painting with light because next up we have two Vans RB4s equipped with fireworks. The team is called the Firebirds. What an appropriate name, as you shall shortly see. But that is not the uh, last typhoon action we shall see this weekend. We do have another typhoon display expected tomorrow. Uh, if you want to join us tomorrow, then... Uh, you can do so. We are streaming once again for the Sunday of the Bournemouth Air Festival, but we are asking uh, for a small amount of money in order to watch that stream. You can uh, either uh, pay up to be a YouTube channel member. That's a great way of supporting the channel and encouraging us to do more of this kind of thing. Or if you want to go the full hog, then head to watch.planestv.com and sign up to our streaming service. We currently have a special offer code available. The offer code is Bournemouth with a capital B. That will give you 50% off your first month subscription to watch.planestv.com. So once again, head to watch.planestv.com and use the offer code Bournemouth. That will get you access to all of our live streams tomorrow here from the Bournemouth Air Festival. But it will also get you uh, access to some of our upcoming live streams, including the Duxford Battle of Britain Air Show coming up in two weeks' time. And our back catalogue of programmes stretching back 34 years. Well, we're showing you the typhoon breaking to land at Bournemouth Airport. I thought I might have seen a, a brief flash of afterburner there. It was difficult to make out on the screen in front of me, and the aircraft is a very long way, almost invisible to the naked eye. But the typhoon breaking to land at Bournemouth, extending its landing gear now. And I'm sure Matt Brighty is ready for a, a bit of a break after a very intense display sequence. He's doing such a good job this season and we've so much enjoyed seeing him display the Typhoon FGR4 for us. So we're going to try something a little bit different this evening with the pyro shows. Uh, yesterday I did a, a sort of fairly conventional commentary uh, on some of them. And this time we're going to try and impart a little more of the atmosphere of the show rather than just going for information sharing. So I'm not going to talk so much. That means uh, I think probably the thing to do is to introduce the next act now so that I don't have to do quite so much talking once it started its display. We're going to be seeing a pair of Vans RV4s known as the Firebirds. They are kit planes built by the Vans Aircraft Company. They have uh, some aerobatic performance, as we will see, but they are primarily touring aircraft. They've got two seats, rooms and baggage, a cruise speed of 200 miles an hour, 600 mile range, Service ceiling, 23,000 feet. But they can loop, they can roll, they can do stall turns, albeit not particularly tight ones. We're going to see some of that demonstrated today uh, with a very precise display of formation flying, but accompanied by pyrotechnics on the wingtips. This team was founded, known as the Fireflies, in 2017 by Andy Durston and John Gowdy, then uh, flying two RV4s. But as John and Andy became busier with their Warbird projects, they gradually started handing over the team to two new pilots, 
Nigel Reed and John Dodd. Last year, John and Nigel took full ownership of the Fireflies and changed the name to the Firebirds. So we uh, normally see them while they're still in the hold off to our left. Uh, the fuselages have been adorned with LED lights, computer controlled, so that they can create a variety of colours and patterns. It does mean the aircraft stand out very well from a distance against a dark sky such as what we can see at the moment. And I can't see any lights yet, but as soon as we can see them, we'll get the camera on them and show you those uh, well, rather, rather, rather odd-looking aircraft as they appear with their lights on when they're in the distance. Uh, there's often reports when they are flying about of people who think they've seen UFOs. Sometimes the local press get hold of it and say uh, there's been UFO activity. Well, there's the view off to our right-hand side, and if you're not familiar with the geography of Bournemouth, we're looking towards Bournemouth Pier. You can't actually see the pier. It's uh, obscured behind the walls on the roof of the hotel, but we are south-facing at Bournemouth. That means the sun is setting off to our right, slightly brighter sky in the direction that you're currently looking. Off to our left, we have Boscombe Pier. The air display takes place between Bournemouth and Boscombe Piers. Uh, show centre biased slightly towards the Boscombe end. Show centre slightly to the left of where we are by about 300 metres or so. I can see there is a speck in the middle of the frame and I'm wondering if that is a distant Vans RV4 or 2. It's difficult to make out. Slot time, in all fairness, isn't until 19.58, so still two minutes away. These nighttime displays do have to be very tightly timed because uh, it's not legal to display after the end of uh, the official twilight period. That's 30 minutes after sunset. So there's a good amount of contingency time that's been built into the schedule to make sure that any delays can be comfortably absorbed without running over that uh, hard stop time at sunset plus 30. Plenty of other parts of the world where air displays can continue into night time. The United States, of course, we see it quite a lot over there. Poland, uh, much of mainland Europe, in fact, and uh, even in the United Kingdom, sort of, depending on how you define the United Kingdom, uh, there's a different aviation authority in Jersey. So uh, in the Channel Islands, there have been a number of displays at true night. Uh, to be honest, though, I quite enjoy seeing them in the sort of conditions that uh, you're watching on the screen at the moment. Having a bit of cloud definition, a bit of colour in the sky. Yeah, maybe the fireworks don't stand out quite as brightly, but it's such a picturesque scene. you've never seen a night show before 
then let me assure you it is absolutely magical. We're not going to see fireworks initially from the Firebirds. They do the first half of their show uh, just with smoke and lights, and the fireworks will kick in around the halfway point. I'll give you a good amount of warning before they do. But uh, yeah, the phrase I tend to use is painting with light in the sky. And even though we're seeing many of the same manoeuvres we saw from the Firebirds during their day show, it takes on a whole different character under cover of darkness. It is also, I hasten to add, an enormous amount of work. Fixing the pyro to the aircraft, wiring it all up. Uh, so there are metal attachments on the wingtips and the pyrotechnic effects usually come in cardboard tube and tubes and boxes. They are um, fixed into those metal attachments using tape and jubilee clips and zip ties. And then uh, each pyrotechnic effect has um, an e-match or igniter inserted into it. Uh, the other end of that goes into a like a socket uh, on a sort of a uh, board of sockets on the wingtip and uh, and then a switch in the cockpit that can send an electric current uh, to each of those sockets in turn so you press the button anything wired into the first socket will be ignited those fireworks will go off press the button again anything connected to the second socket uh, will be fired and so on and so on i think the fireflies have four uh, firing solutions as they're known, four of those sockets that they can wire fireworks to uh, on each wingtip on each aircraft. Otto the helicopter has eight. We'll be seeing Otto after the Firebirds and uh, the amount of pyro on that aircraft is absolutely ludicrous. 2,500 pyrotechnic shots per display on Otto. Uh, it's a good ten or so man hours to prepare that for its show. Well, we see now the landing lights of the Firebirds. They're approaching on the B axis. Or are they? They're more on the left 45, really. More or less in front of us. You can just about make out the LEDs on the side of the fuselage as well. As we get zoomed in there, Ian doing a fantastic job of tracking these aeroplanes. Uh, yeah, one of them uh, glowing pink, the other one glowing green. And the colours changing rapidly as the smoke comes on. They're starting in line abreast with a loop, very challenging formation in which to fly. One pilot looking straight out across his shoulder at the other aircraft in order to maintain station in the formation. And now, from line abreast to line astern, the aircraft not flying one beside the other, but one behind the other. That's a much easier shape in which to fly turns and barrel rolls. This is the standard two-ship formation, Echelon. One aircraft flying slightly behind and out to the side of the other, usually a little bit of vertical separation as well. And we are getting towards the point now where the pyro is going to start firing. We're about to ramp up the ante of this display and make things really rather magical if they weren't already.
These are called Roman candles.
because some things are better enjoyed without commentary, I think, and that is one of them. Absolutely beautiful. And we're not quite over yet, because while the pyro has expired, we do have one last manoeuvre, an expression of appreciation from the Firebirds to all who have been watching and enjoying this display as they turn back towards show centre, and they'll be drawing in the sky a heart. just about visible against what is now quite a dark sky and uh, it's interesting I'm looking at the sky uh, as it is to the naked eye and also looking down at the monitor in front of me and uh, uh, yeah often we say that it does look slightly darker uh, on the uh, computer screen than it does to the naked eye in real life but actually today they're fairly closely matched and this is pretty much what you are seeing is fairly representative of what I'm seeing out in front of me. A uh, great colour in the sky as well off to our right hand side looking absolutely spectacular. The Firebirds giving us a farewell fly past from right to left and then they'll head back to Bournemouth Airport after a stellar show. And if you thought that was impressive, well, we're about to see a lot more pyro than that. Fired from a helicopter that has been specially modified for this purpose by a man who I'm sure would not mind me describing him as utterly bonkers. I am talking, of course, about Brendan O'Brien. And uh, just to give you an indication of how utterly bonkers he is, I'm going to read you a short biography. Um, so he has 13,000 flight hours and over 300 aircraft types, including gliders, fast jets, hot air balloons, helicopters, float planes, microlites, and more. He's flown on every continent on Earth, including Antarctica, where he flew twin otters for the British Antarctic Survey. He's presented TV shows, Spitfire Race and Flight Line. He's a flight instructor and adventurer. He commentates and performs at air shows. He also serves as one of Britain's most qualified display authorization examiners. Basically, when someone wants to get a DA on an aircraft that is totally ludicrous and which no one has ever displayed before, like Rich Goodwin's jet pits, Bremden is one of just two or three people who is able to award them that display authorization. In 2016, he purchased a helicopter called Otto, a modified Schweitzer 300 developed by Roger Buis in the United States. He then brought it to the UK and modified it for pyro displays, or as he calls them, skygasms. As part of that night show, the aircraft can fire 2,500 pyrotechnic shots. It's locked in fierce, friendly competition with Scandinavian air shows Grum and Agcat as to who can launch the most pyro per display. And I'm not quite sure who's ahead at the moment. I think uh, Grum and Agcat is ahead by uh, nose, but really, as a spectator, you uh, don't notice much difference. It's an absurd quantity of pyro from both. Over the next few minutes, we're going to see gerbs, flares, Roman candles, shells, and my personal favourite, crackle comets. To fire the pyro, Brendan is using a new radio-controlled detonation system, a small unit strapped to his neck leg, which can send radio signals to each of two firing stations, which have eight firing solutions each. The smoke is on, a very powerful smoke system. And I'll warn you now, as the aircraft departs, it is going to look like it's on fire. It isn't. Someone always says in the chat, Otto's on fire. Nope, that's just a powerful smoke system with a very strong light shining back into it. We're about to see the gerbs firing. There they go. These are very similar to the waterfalls we saw earlier, but cold burning. You can put your hand through them quite safely. There's a very short flame of a couple of inches, but the rest is not hot at all. These are stage fireworks. They can be used indoors, but we're about to up the ante substantially, and I think it is once again time for me to stop talking and hand over to the music.
What a performance from Brendan O'Brien. I hope you enjoyed that. I can't help but enjoy that. Seen it so many times, but uh, yeah, absolutely unbeatable. The sheer volume of pyro in such a short amount of time. And then seeing a helicopter in the middle of it is just madness. Nigel Luck sums up my thoughts exactly. He says, this is nuts. Thank goodness for nutters. Brendan departing back to Bournemouth Airport now. He's not taking part in the show tomorrow. That was his final appearance of the Bournemouth Air Festival 2023. So thank you very much to him. What a superb display. And uh, yeah, there's nothing else quite like it uh, on the British air show circuit. And that, I think, brings us to the end of our flying display for today. We'll keep the stream running a little while longer and have a bit of a chat with you all. But uh, before you all go, I do want to remind you it's not the end of the Bournemouth Air Festival. There is one more day to go, a full day of entertainment tomorrow, which we will be live broadcasting. But in order to watch tomorrow's live broadcast, we are asking you to do one of two things. Either uh, become a channel member here on YouTube. That's a great way of uh, encouraging us to do more of these free streams. Uh, or alternatively, Go the full hog and subscribe to our on-demand streaming service, watch.planestv.com. We have a special offer running this weekend. And if you use the code Bournemouth with a capital B at watch.planestv.com, you can get 50% off your first month subscription. That is one month for £5, giving you access to tomorrow's live broadcast from here at Bournemouth, plus uh, the exclusive to Planes TV um, live broadcast from the Duxford Battle of Britain Air Show in two weeks' time. That will be going out on our streaming service. And of course, for the duration of your subscription, you'll have access to our 34-year back catalogue of air show programmes. We are in the process of digitising more of that back catalogue. And uh, I can attest to the fact that there's really not much better on a cold, miserable winter's evening than to be able to open up watch.planestv.com on your computer and watch a little bit of Milton Hall action from the 90s. So I think what we're probably going to do is wrap up the broadcast now so that we can get packing away because it is getting dark here and it'd be nice to put a kit away uh, while there's still a bit of light to see by. It's going to be a half hour job to pack up. So it just remains for me to say thank you very much for joining us over the past three days. We hope that many of you uh, have either become channel members or subscribed to our on-demand service so you can join us again tomorrow. Uh, welcome to Brad Pettit, who has just joined us in the last few seconds. Thank you very much, and we look forward to seeing you again on Sunday. So I think I shall say goodbye. Thank you very much once again. And I hope to see you again, if not tomorrow, then on another Planes TV live broadcast very soon.